Welcome back. I hope you had a great time and we're going to continue our conversations uh, in a very, very interesting masterclass this afternoon called The Arc of the Art. And to start, we're going to have Stefan Brouwer that you met this morning, armomondio.io. You know how much it's difficult for French to say that? In the cloud. Then we're going to have Marcus Wiesenhofer and Jürgen Posel, manager at RTQ and Marcus is from the Belvedere Museum about tokenizing art, the KISS NFT by Gustav Klimt. And then after a short break, um, we'll have Richard Zalan, CEO and co-founder at Virtual Gallery, a cyberspace for art. So let's start. Enjoy your afternoon, people. And uh, thank you, Leonard. Good afternoon, everyone. So. Our next speaker, I think he doesn't really need an introduction. He has enlightened us with his insights during the first panel this morning. Super inspiring. So I'd like to ask Stefan to come on stage for our first masterclass. Yeah, come on, come on. Uh, we can begin now. Just an FYI, this has been time to last around 45 minutes, so you have that time constraint. Okay. And in case you want, there's a couple of battle words there. Thank you so much. That's it. My job is done. Yes. The floor is completely yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you, Kaze, for organizing everything. Patrice, uh, Dalila, and everyone. Um, so, actually, it's quite emotional for me to, to speak about, uh, actually, it will be in March 2022, 10 years, that I uh, had my first exhibition in, uh, in the Imperial Palace of Compiègne, and um, we will go through together this, uh, this process, and, um, and I will explain uh, how it works. So I started with a very uh, humble uh, means. Um, I decided, uh, when I started, more than a little 10 years ago, to work with just a computer, and a phone, and, I'm, and uh, to create my works, I only use one single software, which was Keynote. Uh, and I will show you now uh, one of the first videos that I, um, that I made. Uh, actually, this is, I wanted to create in this video um, a work that speaks about the relationship between the physical and the virtual. So here we have the sea and uh, a fragmentation of actually what the, the light is actually the sun. And uh, both reality meets at this very fine line where they are both together uh, united. Uh, and uh, so this was the first video that I made. I shot this with an iPhone 5 maybe and then rework the video. It's called Cosmic Horizon. The, in, uh, in physics, the, the cosmic horizon is uh, uh, the, the further, the farther we can go, uh, the further has, where light has gone. So this video is a reflection about the nature of light. The, the light is both, as we know, a wave and a particle, depending if we measure it or observe it. Um, so, yeah, right now, everyone in, in, in physics, in quantum physics, is trying to find a unity between the macro, macroscopical world, and the macro world, and the micro world, the world of the infinitely big and the world of the infinitely small. And so I wanted through this video, which was one of my first work, uh, to try and unite and speak about, about that. So this uh, questioning about... Um, how do we unite physical and virtual was already embedded, embedded in this video from the very start. Then, I oh know, this is not the good one, but it's okay. Um, we can uh, work with this. 
this is um, this was uh, actually uh, my first state commission from France. Uh, it was for the musée, uh, the, the Franco-American Museum of uh, Blirancourt. Uh, it was in, uh, in, they reopened it after 12 years of, um, of uh, restoring this uh, fantastic museum that speaks about the birth of the relationship between France and America. Uh, and the first exchange between artists, between French artists and American artists. And so they wanted, in, in the honor of the reopening of this museum, to create, they asked me to create a donor's wall, you know, a wall with the names of the donors, but I wanted to make something digital, because like donor's wall are usually <laughs> super boring. It's usually a, you know, a marble thing with the names of people and everything. So it was quite a challenge actually to imagine what could be a donor's wall. So this is uh, what I proposed. Actually, the names appear in the sort of galaxy here uh, later, but you, you will not see it. Uh, and you can see from this piece already uh, the, the, the first research on the icons, you know. So we, are, we have here two plates of, uh, of brass in gold and a screen. And the video actually is not a digital work, it's a real video. I filmed uh, particles of metal that were floating in water. And um, we have another... So there again, you know, we have uh, here the relationship between the material and the virtual and how, and also this uh, kind of uh, aesthetic that I'm very uh, obsessed with, which is uh, flat worlds, you know, flat lines, something that has no volume, that is extremely um, uh, pure. Uh, so this was the inauguration with the French uh, <laughs> Ministry of Culture, uh, Françoise Dissène. So we unveiled uh, the piece together. It was quite, quite an honor. So there we go. And it was quite beautiful here to install a, a piece of digital work, which is a permanent piece, uh, part of the part of the, the museum forever. Uh, and to have in such a traditional museum to have a, a digital work was uh, was uh, was very cool. Uh, after this, um, after this, um, I'm sorry because the, the whole video thing is not in the right, <laughs> um, uh, you know, order. So I'm just uh, improvising right now. Okay. Uh, so as you see, I was thinking at the time about screens, about the color gold, about the icons. Actually, before that, uh, I had I, I had discovered a real icons that really inspired me, but. I wanted to recreate uh, with this work that you will see now uh, the, I, you know, the, the new relationship and speak about the new relationship we have towards classical art or any kind of art with our screens, you know. So, so this is a technique. Uh, this is a cariatide from the Louvre. We're just testing. Um, ah, this is the, so this is actually how it's made, it's quite interesting. Um, Yeah, so as you see, it's, uh, this is a preparatory works in, uh, in gold aluminium. 
Uh, the final works are in gold stainless steel. It's a UV print on uh, gold stainless steel. It's a technique I have um, created. And um, the image is dematerialized. Actually, it's printed with micro lines. So it's an extremely precise uh, process. Um, usually the lines, the printed lines, are around uh, one millimeter, and the empty lines, which is left uh, gold, is around uh, 0 0.4 millimeter. And so this enables to have both the, well, you can see here, to have both the, uh, the image and the reflection, because the, 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 the reflection is as important as the work. So for example, here the work is contextualized within uh, an auditorium, and you are part of the work. Uh, so the, the, the idea was to, to have uh, something that was quite immersive, and in a way you are part of the work, and uh, this leads to the reflection uh, towards the metaverse, whereas in the metaverse, well, you are inside the artwork, you are not exterior to the artwork. So this was the first step that I um, made with uh, either clouds or paintings, to, to have people like kind of enter the work, uh, but without, of course, using a digital screen or electricity or, or um, but just to have them in, in real life. So then this is the process, how I work is uh, everything is dematerialized, no studio, no uh, assistant, no employees, no nothing. So I work with people all around the world, anywhere they are. And uh, this perhaps is the... A thicker material, like like six millimeters, this is perhaps. The discussions and we have with the engineers. Having here two millimeter aluminium left, so you in, it, in top you could have a, a, a hole which is going through. Otherwise, you can't uh, drill it. You can't make it because we have to screw it into the wall. That's no, that's for sure. For sure. <laughs> that's for sure. That's yeah. for sure. That is not a problem. But then the the what you so. Um, we were talking right now about a system that I uh, put together for these works, which is a hanging system, because like the, the front is like a digital screen, okay? And behind, I wanted the, the works not to hang on the wall and to be uh, like, uh, you know, um, I wanted to, the work to levitate. I wanted the work to float in space. So I invented a, 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 hang, a new hanging system with magnets, actually. So this is the discussions we were having with the, with the engineers. Uh, behind the works, you have a sort of structure in aluminium with magnets and uh, something that you take away and put on the wall, and then you, you just bring the work towards this thing, and it, it, it's, it magnetized to the wall. It's, it's quite magical, and it's very beautiful, and so a work that can be a very heavy, 50 kilos, 100 kilos more, they, they are not you know, hanging, they, they just float like this in sort of... Um, um, uh, this is actually a work uh, that I have developed with the Louvre Museum. During the second uh, pandemic, uh, I was uh, working on a series about angels, and I asked the Louvre if I could go in the museum and uh, make a photo of this angel by Rembrandt. Uh, and um, thanks to the angels, uh, actually, they opened the door to me, and I could enter in the museum during, during a moment in time where all of the museums in France were closed. So it was absolutely, uh, you know, the, the most sublime experience. And then I reworked, the, um, I reworked the angel, made it even levitate even more, and, uh, and uh, now it floats in gold. And uh, it has been, uh, you know, cut as a, as a, as a matrix. Uh, the, the way it's cut actually is quite uh, humoristic in a way because, um, wait. Uh, I actually cut it like an Instagram post, you know, with the three, uh, like that. <laughs> uh, and also it's cut in 12 uh, kind of, uh, it's not perfect squares, but 12 parts. Um, actually, uh, in mathematical theory, there are uh, two sublime numbers. Uh, one is the number 12, and the other one is so long that I can not even start uh, telling you. But um, it's funny that, uh, yeah, there is a, a number that is sublime, which is one of the subjects that I explore. And uh, the, the number, one of the number that is sublime is 12, and the, a, this angel has been cut in 12 parts. Um, what else? So, 
Exactly. Let's get into it then. So, actually, what you see here is not a freestanding piece. It's not an independent work. It's, uh, it's a preparatory work for uh, an exhibition project that I'm working on at the National Museum in Rome. This is actually here the director of the museum, Stéphane Verger, who is uh, one of the most brilliant uh, archaeologists uh, in the world. And uh, so he is the head of the National Museum in Rome, and he was kind enough when I came to visit him in, uh, in September uh, 20, um, I don't know, in September of uh, one year, I don't know which year it was, but not uh, like um, maybe one year ago. So. And uh, he made me visit the whole, uh, the whole museum, and then he told me, come with me, and I will show you something that no one knows. And he opened this room, which is actually something that you see here that no one else has seen. Even in Rome, people don't know this room. So this is the beauty of Rome. Uh, it's called the, the Chiostro del, del Gioiello, the, the, the room of the jewel, la salle du joyau. So I asked the other day, but why? And they say, because it's beautiful as a jewel. And I say, yeah, of course. So I entered here and I fell in love, you know, because all my life, and all my works, and when you dedicate yourself to, you know, for example, the Angel by Rembrandt, I spent quasi one year just looking at this angel. <laughs> it was so beautiful. So, um, and, and it's the same for an architecture or whatever, you know, you put your mind into something, and because this is going to be your life, you know, this is going to be your life, you know, and uh, on TV you see the wars, you see, and you're like, my, no, no. So, the only way to survive, you know, in this crazy world is to uh, just focus yourself on, on, on beauty and on things that, you know, makes you levitate uh, in, in a way. So, he, we, we entered this, this space, the Chiostro del, del Gioiello, and I was at the moment working on a, on a concept which were monolith. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to work with the same technique as here, but I had the idea of, uh, of having some monolith with faces that would look at the light, at the sky, in ecstasy, you know, to, cre to, to, to bring back this emotion of the ecstasy, which I think is also uh, an emotion that we have lost, well, unless you take uh, ecstasy, of course, but um, um, it's a kind of an emotion that we have lost in the contemporary world, but uh, I also had the feeling that in the virtual world, uh, we would regain this idea of the ecstasy because you put the you put the, the the thing on your on your on your eyes, and you have this oh, wow you know you, you have this uh, this this feeling of uh, you know you are, and so there is a, a skylight in this room and this was perfect because this was the the perfect room where I was, uh, you know having this research on the monolith then. Uh, Every space brings a new idea, so this is the great thing also to focus yourself on, a, on, a, on an architectural space. So every space, when you focus yourself on a space, you, you have a new idea that comes to you. And so the monolith, I had the idea already, so I integrated the monolith idea in here, but then I looked at the, the way the, 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 the floor was structured with those geometrical shapes and everything, and I had the idea to create what I call the digital landscape, which is actually uh, a floor uh, that would be just only clouds, just clouds, as if you would enter paradise and you were above the clouds looking like this, and the light that would reflect would you know, make everything explode and, uh, and make it actually very much as if you were kind of entering a metaverse, but in, the, in, in reality. So it's kind of how do you create a physical exhibition that looks like you are walking into a metaverse, but it's a physical exhibition. And, and uh, by working on this project physically, I also wanted to create a metaverse, a real, a real metaverse. So uh, the exhibition is called Amor Mundi, so the love of the world. Why Amor Mundi? Because Rome was, um, at the time, uh, called Caput Mundi, which is the capital of the world. Caput Mundi, Rome was the, the capital of the world. And, uh, and, um, and so I, I, loved, I loved this idea of Mundi, because when you create a metaverse, you create a world. So Mundi is the world. So, but, 
you know, what world do you want? You want a world full of love, of course. So Amor Mundi, and also Amor, when you play it around with the letters, it's Roma. So, uh, and, um, so you said Amor Mundi is not easy to say in, in French, but actually it's uh, Amor Mundi, it's a Latin, so it's quite easy for French to say Amor Mundi. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so this, this, this piece is actually one part of the floor. This is actually made to be installed on the floor. I mean, if you're a collector and you want to hang it on the wall, we have the system behind to hang it on the wall, it's not a problem. But it's the, the way it's uh, thought for this project is to be installed on the floor. So on the floor here, you will have 42 pieces that are each connected to each other. So they all exist individually, like this, as a one piece, but they are part of a network of pieces. So this is also something in terms of sculpture, how to think about a sculpture, and to think in terms of sculpture, in terms of a network of works that are interconnected within each other, and not just one sculpture, one sculpture, you know, independent with... The... So, they, so this is what I wanted to create. So um, I, we don't have the... So wait, I can show you the, the room, the beautiful room. So you see all the empty spaces on the floor, etc. The, the, even the rooftop, everything, you know? And so the idea was to transform entirely this room into a cloud room and to have in the center the monolith that look up to the light. Uh, and uh, I, so I wanted to you know, install here, but also there, the room is at the The walls are obviously protected. It's a national museum, you can imagine. Uh, and this is also the, the fun part to do projects in national museums because everything is so difficult. <laughs> Um, but, um, so I said, but, you know, we will make, we will digitize this room, and even though we cannot make the dream uh, in, in the physical world, because there are too many constraints, we can make the dream appear in the, in the digital world. So this is why when you asked me uh, earlier, what is digital? It's the dream, you know, the, 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 the digital world is about the absolute dream that you can, because you can make anything in the digital world. So, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the metaverse that we created is actually a, a virtual world that exists in a world of, it's an infinite world of clouds, and you travel in this world, you fly above the clouds, you have the sun is always centered in front of you, and then you arrive in the National Museum in Rome, you can see an exhibition, then you can go see another exhibition by another artist, because of course this metaverse will be open to other artists, not just one artist. And, uh, but, and this will be the launch in Rome of, at the same time, uh, uh, an exhibition, and the birth of this new metaverse, which is actually the reason why we're here today, is to speak about the metaverse. If, so this is, this, is, this is how it starts. Ah, yes, so this, um, okay, this is a work, uh, so I was very inspired, as you, as you may have seen, by architecture, but uh, suddenly I had also uh, started a passion for frames, even though in real life I don't like frames, I like my works to be no frames, borderless, but digitally, uh, I love frames, so. And uh, I had this, I had this, uh, this tabernacle, tabernacle, from the Renaissance, uh, and uh, it's very funny because I had the discussion, it was like maybe in 2016 or 2015, with a, with a guy on Facebook, and he was a curator, and I think he was, he told me he was the curator of the Lebanese uh, pavilion at the Venice Biennale, and he made a political act at the Venice Biennale, he exposed nothing. <laughs> he was totally crazy. Anyway, we had crazy discussions together, and... Um, and he, he posted this tabernacle, and I was like, wow, but this was so... And so I, I saved it, you know, and I looked at it, I looked at it for like... And then in 2018, I created this Pong game. I created this uh, on Keynote, this, this very simple... Uh, but I thought it was very playful and minimal. Um, So there's no winner, no losers here. No one wins, no one loses. It's an equilibrium, perfect equilibrium. Um, 
And it's uh, actually the, 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 the first video game is a, is a Pong game. It's very iconic, in the, of course, in the, in the gaming community and the, in, the, in the history of, um, of uh, yeah, um, gaming and everything. And so, listen, I had this work since, let's say, from what my phone tells me, uh, 2018 it was made. And just, I loved it. I thought it was so cool, you know, but I was like, what am I going to do with you? It's like a child who, you know, has his uh, university degree but uh, doesn't leave home, you know, and like, just go. And I, I had no, at the time, the art world was not ready for, a, for work like that. It was too, I don't know, not enough political, uh, not, I don't know. So, um, no, but jokes aside, so, and what happened with this work is quite magical. Um, in January of this year, I had a huge motorcycle accident. A Range Rover hit me. I was in the, I couldn't move. I was in my hospital bed, uh, and uh, I only had one arm left to move. This was this year. I'm standing now, but <laughs> it was a crazy year. And um, they, I had one arm, and thank God, I had in my phone, my, in my phone, I had all my works, all of them, because of the of the choice that I made 10 years ago to have no studio, no, no anything, just have one phone, one computer, work on one single software, which is Keynote, I had everything in my phone. And I was in my hospital bed all day, couldn't move, couldn't do nothing, and this is how I started NFT, from my hospital bed. Uh, I, I went on Twitter, I started connecting with the, with the crypto community, I started making friends, you know, I started speaking with artists, then a, a girl which called Hermine Bourdin uh, told me, listen, there is this auction, it's the, the first official NFT auction in France, it's called the Burnt Auction, it was almost, um, almost prohibited, but the, the, the auction house Fauve Paris was, was able to, to, to make the first, so she told me, let's, so, and I had all my work, so I said, which one do you want? And I sent them the Pong, and they said, we love it. And uh, it exploded at auction. It was sold for, I don't know, like 11,000 euro, which is, I mean, a lot for, you know, a, a digital work, even though we speak about board apes and everything, but I mean, in crypto art, it was like the third record in France. And I was in, uh, well, at the time I, I came out from the hospital, so I, 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 I saw the auction, actually, maybe we have the movie somewhere. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I, I continued the series of, uh, of frames and integrating video games which, uh, into a frame. So uh, this video game is actually the first uh, video game, well, maybe the only one, that Elon Musk has coded when he was 12 years old. So it's called Blastar. So this as well was sold to John Carp, uh, that everyone knows in the Web3 um, community. This uh, is uh, also, this is a sublime story actually, um, because the, so as you see, I was totally fascinated by frames, so I had this program, internal program with, with frames, and uh, obviously behind the Pac-Man, <laughs> there is a real painting. And the, the crazy story is that um, actually the frame and the painting are not made by the same artist. Uh, the frame uh, here is made by uh, Francesco Di Giorgio, which uh, was one of the big inspiration for Leonardo da Vinci. He, he was an amazing engineer, and, uh, and you can see from this frame how, 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 how extraordinary this frame is. And so I, I integrated, so this is also... <laughs> So I think it's a great analogy of life, you know, we're trapped in this matrix, uh, like Pac-Man, we're trying to survive, you know, the, the dots actually initially uh, were created by this Japanese um, game design, he, the, the dots actually, for your information, are pizzas. <laughs> and uh, so, 
Uh, I thought it was, you know, quite fun to just, you know, contrast everything. This is uh, the iconic work, uh, Space Invader. Of course. Um, this is, uh, this is a work called Apocalypsis, about the danger of ecology, no, I'm kidding. Um, save the planet. No, no, uh, it, yeah, just, uh, you know. Uh, ah, wait, this, do we have it? Oh, no. We don't have it. Oh, it's a shame. I know we have it. Uh, this, I gifted this work to, for uh, Avocats Sans Frontières, Lawyers Without Frontiers. So uh, I gifted this work um, to, it was auction, and it was actually the, the highest uh, auction uh, for the, for the, to help the, the, those lawyers who help people around the world. And uh, it's just an eternal cycle of uh, this uh, triangle form that reminds I don't know how it is in other countries, but in France, the, the robe uh, of the lawyer is black and white. Oh, yeah, no, I think it's only in France, maybe. No, I mean, we have the robe in France anyway, black and white. So, black and white, and, um, and uh, just, you know, uh, life that can be broken and repaired to infinity. So, broken, repaired, broken, repaired. This eternal cycle of re reparation. Uh, this I also made from my hospital bed. I did so many things from my hospital bed. This is the beauty of digital. Um, actually, we digitized the uh, angel by Rembrandt. And um, this is a Fusuma. This is a Japanese masterpiece. So when I was in my hospital bed, a curator friend of mine told me, listen, there is an exhibition project for the anniversary of Mitsui, which is a huge uh, company in Japan. And uh, it's, a, it's a digital exhibition, so uh, we should put a work there. And so, at first, the idea was to digitize the angel by Rembrandt and just put the angel in the exhibition. And then I looked at the history of Mitsui, and I see that uh, Mitsui Group, they have one of the most beautiful collections in the world. And in their collection, they have national treasures. So I was in my hospital bed, and I was like, national treasures, wow. <laughs> So I looked at and, and those, those, those works that are painted with gold, with leaves, with, uh, you know, are masterpieces like from the utmost subtle and beautiful like works. And so I asked them, I told them, listen, I want to, I want to work with a national treasure. I want to digitize a national treasure and with the, the team of people because, you know, digital work is not just about a digital work. Digital work is, as, as we said before, you know, it's about networks, and networks is also human networks. So, you know, we, a lot of people think that the digital is, uh, is a very cold world about computers and everything, but it's very human, actually. It's about connecting, working together at a distance, everywhere in the world, we unite, and this is the most beautiful thing. So, imagine, I'm in my hospital bed, I, I, I ask and I tell them, I want to digitize a national treasure, they find a national treasure in, um, in, uh, in uh, Kyoto. They find a national treasure in Kyoto, in a temple in Kyoto. The monk, because there was a monk who uh, you know, was the head of this temple, accepted that we make a photo, digitize and everything, and it was shown. So we did this, it was so, so beautiful. So I was in my hospital bed, couldn't move. They sent me photos of the temple. I was like, wow, this is crazy. So it helped me survive, you know, and um, then we decided because, you know, the reflection of these gold works are as important as the, as the image itself. So what did we do here? We actually integrated in the Fusuma the reflections of the Louvre, and in the angel that is actually in the Louvre, we digitized the, the temple in Kyoto, and we integrated the images of the temple in Kyoto, and then there is this dialogue that is between, you know, outside of time and space, uh, where we confront temporalities and, and, and uh, in architecture and art. And arch excuse me, yeah, okay, please. Uh, so, uh, so here we have the, you know, pyramid, of course, and the temple. And um, yeah, so that was uh, that was one of the one of the hospital projects. Um, 
So it was important to integrate in these works the reflections uh, within the digital work and to show the different layers of information, because it's about layers of information. Uh, this is um, actually working within metaverse uh, projects. We also, of course, work with gaming softwares. So here we work with Unreal, uh, Unreal, uh, Unreal, uh, you know, Unreal. Actually, it's called Unreal. <laughs> and um, and uh, so we have generated this infinite world of clouds within Unreal Engine, Unreal Engine. Um, and, uh, and this is the experience that you will have in VR, because uh, when you enter Amor Mundi, so when you enter Amor Mundi in VR, you are an angel and you fly above the clouds. And um, yeah, so what else? Ah, but that's it. Okay. Ah, bon, bon, okay. Oh, oui, oui. So this was, let's go fast. Okay, we go fast. This was my first exhibition. I arrived in this castle. I had never exhibit, exhibited in my, in my life. It's finished? Ten minutes? Okay, so we go, okay. So this was uh, the architecture, you know. This was the room. This was this incredible room. When I arrived here, I said, this is the most beautiful room in France. La salle des gardes, du, the uh, salle des gardes of the Imperial Palace of Compiègne. So this was my first keynote uh, drawing at the time. You know, I was working just with keynote. And then this, this is what was installed. So it was a prism of pure light. Uh, it was 11 meters high within the, 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 the Salle des Gardes. And uh, so the, the, the prism actually alternated between white and gold. Uh, and uh, so, okay, we can go quite fast. These were keynote drawings, actually, and projects that we didn't realize uh, for the different, uh, different parts of the castle. Uh, yeah. This is a research project. Uh, while I was working on this, on this exhibition, uh, they told me, you know, on the road to this castle, there is another castle called Chantilly. I was like, really? So I, I started thinking about a project for Chantilly at the same time, and uh, I imagined this project to... This project was a purely uh, conceptual project, of course, but I work with engineers that... Actually, I work with the engineers, which are climate engineers, which are the ones who work with Jean Nouvel on the dome of the Louvre Abu Dhabi. So they, they, they are engineers, but they, they are climate engineers. And the idea here was to redirect the light of the sun uh, and to use uh, water to materialize the rays of light. So actually, we'd have uh, Eliosat, we would have a very intense mirror that would, that would uh, follow the course of the sun and then redirect the light of the sun towards the garden and transform, here the idea was to transform the garden into a giant solar clock. So this is it. This was the calculation we made for the course you know, of the sun depending on the, on the, um, the month. So, so then we could uh, you know, inform the, the mirrors. So this was just a pure conceptual research. Uh, this is the Palais Royal. So you know, the, we have the Palais Royal in Paris next to the Louvre. This is the garden, uh, the quality is not great, but you can see it's like two giant uh, you know, things in, in sand, very geometrical. And uh, here the research was uh, to install, uh, to create two airport runways within a royal garden. Uh, okay, this is the light, so we didn't see the other, the other images, but it's, it's fine. Uh, okay. So here as well, very mathematical process, very, very precise, extremely serious. And uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, you have uh, an alley that is like 200 meters long and you can just dispose, you know, uh, as many lights as you want. You know, you have no, no one tells you what to do. But the idea was for me to create a work that was as beautiful seen from the sky, from an angle and from the floor, from the, yeah, from the floor. So... This is the research. This is the castle where you saw the, the first digital work, this one. Um, so, what else do we have? <laughs> yes. 
Okay. Ah, yes. This was the. So this is the. This is the icon that actually inspired me. This 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 series that I first started with uh, with painting. So this is a real uh, 18th century Russian icon. So you can see you have the the metal in front and you have the painting behind. And I I I was I I, I bought this icon, and I looked at it for very long. And I really wanted to make something with this icon because, first of all, the, the light that it emitted naturally was so divine. And I wanted to, uh, and I tried to bring all the layers into one layer, which is like uh, the layer of a of a screen or uh, of a com computer screen, you know, and have everything together, you know. So I reduced all the volumes to the minimum to have the gold and the painting and everything, you know. So uh, the first painting I worked on was this painting by Il Garofalo, uh, Benvenuto Tisi. Uh, I started the series with angels because, uh, yes, yeah, so this, this angel, I thought it was really extraordinary, very young, very beautiful, the wings open, very generous, you know, and the, all the jewelry and everything. And so I, I, I worked on it like that. I, I, made the, I made the finger point exactly in the center. Uh, still this obsession with geometry, and um, this you saw. So it's, this was the first work that I showed uh, in, in a group show called Immaterialité in Paris. Okay, what else? So this is also, so this is the technique uh, on stainless steel, so it's a very, very, very precise technique. We have to, everything has to be extremely clean, no feathers, or no um, dust or anything. Uh, this you saw. This is uh, the back of the work, of the stainless steel work, this is aluminium, uh, with the hanging system with, uh, with magnets, so it's as well uh, quite something. Uh, what else do we have? Lou ah yeah, this is the Louvre. So yeah, this is... This was, this was being in the Louvre empty, took the photo, reworked the image on Keynote, made it. Um, ah yeah, then this was the day when I brought the um, well, I brought the piece to the Louvre. They gave me a paper that they received the paper. The Louvre was very happy, uh, and the Louvre came with an NFC chip. So the Louvre, the 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 the, the work is uh, stored on the blockchain, and um, yeah, uh, this is Rome. So yeah, this is the the museum, the room. <coughs> What a ah, yeah. the project. Ah, yeah. So this, this is, hello. This is all of the measurements for the floor. So all of the measurements for the floor as well. Um, everything is made on, on Keynote. Um, so here, actually, so you understand, this work is actually uh, one of the lateral sides. So one of this one, or this one, or this one. Then in the other room over there, you have one corner, and then you have one very big uh, center piece. Um, and this is a cloud photo uh, that I... Oh, this were the, the, the famous uh, monolith. Uh, like that, this is a prototype. Uh, Eternal Games we saw. Uh, okay, the Pac-Man, what else? And then I can speak maybe, yes. So this is how we work, the process, very digital, digital of course. Then can we have the other presentation, please? You know, the, the Amamundi, so I can speak to you about the metaverse. Can we, we've been, yeah? Okay, it's coming. So I'm going to show you real fast how we structured and uh, who is behind uh, the, the Metaverse team. Oh, there we go. So this is Amor Mundi. Uh, so Amor Mundi is a Metaverse. It's like a video game. So the idea was like how do with all of this research that I made for 10 years within painting, within architecture, within national museums, and all, how does all this reflection can take, take core into a new medium and, you, and, you, and a new way to express, you know, what it is to be inside kind of the mind of the artist and how make it fun, you know. So this is 
a metaverse, actually it's a video game, you know. Uh, um, so this is, uh, uh, there are two visions. The, the one vision, as we said, is uh, an exhibition in Rome, and the other vision is the creation of this virtual world. Um, so yes, the, the next destination of art clearly is the metaverse, that's for sure. Um, we are launching uh, this month uh, two Founders Pass, uh, one visionary pass that gives you full access to the metaverse, uh, and one angel pass that gives you a specific access uh, and you can access the sale of NFTs before everyone. You have uh, VIP events into uh, museums. And, um, and uh, yeah, so this is going to be launched on different platforms. We're in discussions with uh, objects, uh, ledger. So the technology behind the metaverse is very, very specific. We have uh, um, uh, the ability to uh, be cross-chain between all networks. Uh, so when we, uh, w NFTs can, uh, you know, uh, go, we work with Teleport, actually, uh, to transit the information uh, from multiple blockchains to BNB chain for a smooth and cost-effective interaction. So um, here as well, behind just a simple digital image, which is, you know, a cloud or a spaceship, or behind the technology is super sophisticated. So that's, that's amazing. Um, what else do we have? It's not working. Bibin? I click. I don't know. Bon, anyway. So. Ah, voilà. Yes. Great. So this is the, the first exhibition in Rome. And yes, the team. So my partner here is uh, David. Uh, he's um, a blockchain expert, and uh, he has founded multiple protocols and different on different blockchains. Um, he's actually one of my very very good friends now. And uh, we have also other teams: Johannes Vilbrenik, uh, Matteo Mazzotti, uh, Romain Harmonique, which is a young guy, amazing, and Nicolas Aubert. <laughs> Sorry, but we just fired him, so he's not a part of the team anymore. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, this is our partners. Um, so that's it. Sure, with pleasure. You see? And I don't wear a watch, an expensive watch like everyone in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone no cars, have no watch. Any, any questions for Stefan? You have exhausted them, I think. No. Ask me anything, please. Melissa, I think you have a question. Um, hello. Uh, I have a question about the uh, exhibition, uh, not exhibition, things you want to build in Rome, yes? In the Rome? Yes. So uh, are you planning to do it in physical world or only in virtual world? No, no, I both. Get it. Both. both. Physical so. and virtual. Actually, let me, if I can go back. Uh, yes. Uh, well, this is not the best image. Oh, yeah. I know. Wait. Yes. So, well, this is not a... So actually, uh, what you see in the center, sorry, what you see in the center is the physical exhibition. And on the sides, it will be only in the metaverse, because as, uh, as I explained, in the physical works, there are a lot of constraints, you know, either the, the walls are protected or X, Y reasons, you know, the physical world is full of impossibilities, always, and you have to be very careful when you work within a national museum, you have to be extremely careful and everything is... So, but this was my absolute vision, and I wanted to keep this vision, even though already doing the, 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 the main installation, you know, with just the floor and the monolith is already extraordinary. But I was like, I want this vision to share this vision, you know, how can I do that? And the museum, actually, and the Ministry of Culture, of, uh, the, the Italian Ministry of Culture, authorized us to digitize the room and to work with NFTs, which 
right now in Italy, it's almost very not accepted to work with NFTs because the, the Musée des Affis had problems because they, they sold NFTs and the Ministry of Culture was not happy because they considered they didn't make enough money out of it. And I agree. I think they're right. So uh, it was not easy to obtain the authorization from the Ministry of Culture to, one, digitize the room. We, of course, told them we would never sell the NFT of the room uh, as it is, you know. So, and, and to transform this room into a cloud room, like, you know, and the cloud is the archetype of this new world, you know. All the information is stored in the cloud, all of the images in the world are stored in the clouds. You are stored in the cloud, you know. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so working with the, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, the cloud is very important. And, uh, yeah, so it exists both ways, but the cool thing, the cool thing is that the, the virtual world, the, the virtual works, like the windows, for example, they will, you will see them virtually, but we can make them physical. So if a collector wants the window, there are only 10, he can say, I want the window, one of the 10, and he receives the window in stainless steel gold, sublime. Yeah. That's the, yeah. So no limits, yes. Uh, hello, hi, my name is Hamid al Belushi, and a very good friend of uh, this great man. He is. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my question is uh, very simple. Are you ready to uh, explore different markets with regards to... Uh, totally. With regards to museums? Yes. Because there is a, a lot of uh, demand Yes. As I've seen, being the uh, director of arts for Sturia Contemporary Arts, yes. one of the agencies uh, from, the U from Italy, which uh, I'm the representative ah, yes. of it Amazing. For, uh, for Middle East. So ah. being, uh, I think, yeah, yeah. Being, in the, being in the industry, uh, I did a lot of marketing for uh, collaborations between Azal Qabesi and Galvin Harrison, uh -huh. who did the installations in Denmark. Uh, uh, so I am very much, I haven't touched, uh, because there, I had a lot of requests but I want to understand, uh, are we ready for exploring different markets? Are you ready for exploring yes. different markets? Yes. Well, I'm, I live in France. I explore Italy <laughs> Okay, perfect. right now. And but uh, uh, no, no, you, we can explore everything. Been, actually, it, actually, Amor Mundi in Italy will be our proof of concept for the international, well, I mean, for the world. Uh, if we succeed with Amor Mundi, which is what we're working on right now, uh, and I think we will succeed. It. Uh, by, what I mean by succeed is by being able to create a physical exhibition that is extremely precise and very well mastered, to create a virtual exhibition that is the same, extremely precise and very well mastered, and to create a strong community of young people around this project, which we have already, and it's building up. We have a, a great community on Twitter, on Discord, we have launched enigmas, so we have people who are thinking about, you know, so we're, the thing is that art is uh, very, very serious. So, you know, we play around, but art is very serious. But we can also make it fun, you know, and for young people, you know, to just want to learn more. And uh, because it's just, you know, you just need to do the first step. And once you're into the art world, you never leave. Yeah, because I think it's, I need to. I think because I need to it's, it's infinite. That. Yeah. There's so many things to learn. It's, you can never know everything. And I, I don't know why so many people in the art world are so, so heavy and pedantic. And you know, like, it's, you know nothing. Just shut up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well said. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about more about this. Definitely. Sure, with pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Yasin. Uh, so, just wanted to ask about uh, if you are uh, partnering with any digital or traditional museums in Dubai. Like Dubai? I just arrived. <laughs> okay. But yes, no, no, listen, uh, it's very funny because my first, first project, uh, before, my, the, the first project that I created at the time was uh, an immaterial company, which was called Flying Concepts. 
and my first project was in Dubai. And it was a tower project. Uh, it was the first sensory tower uh, in the world, but this was like uh, 18 years ago, you know. And this project received acclaim in the press worldwide. Everyone spoke about this project. It was so futuristic and advanced. It's still very relevant today. So I love Dubai. I came when there was not even the Burj Khalifa at the time. There was none. There was, uh, it was, everything was going up the, up the ground, you know, and we couldn't sleep because you felt so much energy. Now I, I came back 18 years ago, I feel the city so much more mature. I didn't say it was not mature, but it was, you know, it was like a child. You know, and now I, I love the energy. It's great. Yeah, I, of course. And there is the Louvre, as I said before. You know, for me, uh, having the Louvre here, uh, like I live next to the Louvre. I go out of my house. I see the Louvre. If I, uh, I would love to come here and see the Louvre. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, because we also, uh, in Dubai, uh, we currently have Toda, the theater of digital art. Yes. Which is a great place for uh, such uh, art. But uh, the question, the other question, which is the follow-up. Uh, so, if you come to the UAE, would you uh, have plans to publish your NFTs in a local Middle Eastern NFT marketplace, like uh, NFT Souk, for example? I don't know them, but sure. I it's, listen, the beauty of this new world is that we can connect together. You know, it's, it's connect. So yes, I say, of course. We have our platform, Amor Mundi, we can do everything. We have programmed the platform to be able to navigate in VR in this platform, to see virtual exhibitions. We have programmed to be able to sell NFTs, to sell physical works that are correlated to NFTs. So in the contract, the contract is a special contract that uh, links physical and virtual, so this is very important. And of course, we can say, listen, we have the works sold on this platform, but it's also available on Amor Mundi. You know, there is no, there, it's, you know, in, 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 the, in the old world, there was the big king and he was the chief of the, of the village, you know. <laughs> There's no chief of the village anymore. Everyone is the chief of his own village, you know. So, and we all connect together and we all work together, you know, this is great. So yes, Thanks so, so the, much. the simple question, answer, sorry, is uh, yes. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, let's thank Stefan sure. for his very interesting masterclass. He's, he will still be here if you want to connect yeah. afterwards, but now we need to give the floor to our second masterclass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I urge you not to go. It, t it will take us 10, 15 minutes to get the, the setup ready for the, for the next guys. But Thank you. Thank you. stay Hi. here. Don't uh, go anywhere. Well, Marcus and Jurgen, please take over the floor and while we get your presentation ready and you can just start. For those of you who weren't here this morning, Marcus and Jurgen uh, were part of the of the morning panel, and they're going to talk, going to give us a masterclass about something that I find completely amazing, which is the tokenization of physical assets. In this particular case, the tokenization of a work of art, of a piece of, of a masterpiece. So they're going to walk us through that experience.
Oh, thank you. Na tej słowie nie. All right, so let's begin with the second masterclass. We'll begin with Marcus. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name, sorry. <laughs> He's CMO at the Belvedere Museum. And continuing with the presentation, joint presentation, uh, we'll have uh, Jurgen, who's also, they work together on this project of tokenization of the KISS. So please, uh, Marcus, take thank, over. Thank you very much, Leandro. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, for those of you who have not been here this morning, we have already been talking a little bit about um, the museum and NFT projects, and uh, I found it really uh, enlightening, uh, also the spirit of this conference. And I'm glad to be able, together with Jürgen Pölzel from RTQ uh, this afternoon, to give you an insight in our digital activities and specifically our The KISS project. Um, yeah, we um, would like to set it up quite interactive and also show you a couple of videos and visuals. So, um, in, within the presentation, uh, I will show you uh, three videos uh, to give you an insight. And we also have, again, the VR glasses out there uh, for you and another invitation for you, maybe in a break afterwards, if you get a chance. Uh, get the glasses and have a close-up look of the KISS and the NFT tiles. Um, yeah, let's go into the um, agenda. Oh, here's the clicker. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, three parts. I will start uh, introducing the museum a little bit for those of you who are not familiar with the Belvedere Museum in Vienna, Austria, um, and give you some insights on how we are approaching uh, digital activities with, uh, in the museum and some international experience as well. And uh, Jürgen will then follow and explain RTQ and what RTQ is doing in that field. And then we jointly going to present the KISS NFT project. And afterwards, we are, we are very happy to discuss with you your view on that. Um, so let's have a quick look. Uh, it's not a history lesson. We are talking about the future mainly, but uh, there's a, a famous saying, there is no future without the history and the present, certainly. And this is just to show you where we are coming from. Uh, our museum is the National Gallery of Austria. And the Belvedere Museum has an Italian, French uh, name, basically, Belvedere which uh, means in Italian and French, actually, the nice view, so something, seeing something beautiful. And that's really what it is. And to the right-hand side, you see the founding father of the Belvedere, who is Prince Eugene, uh, who was in the uh, late 1700s, in the early 1800s in Vienna. And you have to remember in history, um, the Habsburg Empire in, in, in uh, Europe was one of the largest uh, monarchies uh, and empires in that time. And uh, Prince Eugene, he came from the French court. Here's the connection to uh, Stéphane. Uh, he actually left Paris and Versailles 
uh, to work uh, for the Habsburg, so to say, and become uh, one of the leading figures and supporters of the arts. So he, at one point in time, was so successful for the Habsburgs to enlarge the empire, uh, spanning uh, uh, throughout uh, Central Europe and to the Balkans, southeast of, of Europe. He, um, he, he was uh, bestowed a large uh, sum of money, which he again invested in the arts. And he was really a great supporter of the arts in his time. Uh, he actually started a big zoo, uh, which later became the first zoo in the world when it was transferred uh, to Schönbrunn Palace, the oldest zoo in the world, uh, with exotic animals. He also uh, collected um, rare exotic plants in his orangerie, and he supported the best artists and craftsmanship in his time, and he uh, decided to build this enormous estate uh, at that time, 300 years ago, outside of town, uh, now in the heart of the city of Vienna, a two million uh, city, um, uh, one of the largest cities in Europe, and a very vibrant cosmopolitan city. So he built this uh, a magnificent palace um, to enjoy the arts, um, present in a Baroque time, uh, present uh, the works of art that he was collecting, uh, the books, actually still the largest uh, part of the, the, the National Library, uh, go back to Prince Eugene. So he was a great art lover uh, at his time and left us this wonderful uh, heritage when after his death uh, it was transferred to the Habsburgs and the Habsburg ruling family of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire turned it actually into one of the first museums worldwide in 1777, which is quite ast astonishingly remarkable to open it up as a, a collection uh, of the emperor family to the public. So it was free admission uh, for everybody to see uh, the artworks. And I've brought here some of our uh, anniversaries that we are celebrating next year. So next year will be the 300 year anniversary of the completion of the Upper Belvedere, the main palace, where actually the kiss of Gustav Klimt and the, some of the most coveted uh, artworks are shown. Uh, we have three locations in total and I will sh show you right away a video so you get an uh, idea of what we are offering and we are one of the finest museums uh, in Europe and most visited sites in Austria, and we are celebrating a whole history of art. We are preserving artworks from the medieval ages to contemporary art. So we are still collecting uh, on behalf of the Republic of Austria, uh, and there is a collection of more than 20,000 objects uh, in our responsibility that we keep for the future, and uh, we are actively researching it, preserving it, and educating uh, about it. So. What you see here is uh, a sketchy map of our three locations, uh, the Lower Belvedere, the Upper Belvedere. So remember in the Baroque times, you always had those two, two elements uh, mirroring each other with a wonderful Baroque garden. And then uh, a really interesting aspect as well, a museum of contemporary art, going back to uh, the World Exhibition in Brussels in 1958. Uh, so uh, already uh, 65 years ago, uh, when Austria uh, presented first uh, at the World Exhibition uh, with this pavilion, and afterwards uh, it was uh, built by an acclaimed Austrian architect, Karl Schwanzer. It was dismantled in Brussels, Belgium, brought to Vienna, and from the 60s on became this hotspot of creativity and artists and is now part of our family. So that's what we are essentially showing. Most of our visitors definitely want to see the KISS and the famous artworks of Gustav Klimt, uh, Vienna 1900. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, why we are one of the most visited um, museums and attractions. Um, right now, we will show you a little video, just a minute or so to get an idea what it's all about. Enjoy. <laughs>
get an idea of uh, the history and the legacy of art, and there's so much more than Klimt. For those of you not familiar with German, golden, Goldener Frühling actually means the Golden Spring, referring to uh, an important era in art history when Vienna, uh, 1900, was celebrating Ver Sacrum, the Golden Spring, and in really difficult times that we are living in with multiple crises, we are aspiring to offer a Golden Spring with our anniversary year next year, with uh, you know, a whole set of events, exhibitions, highlights throughout the year and celebrating the power of art uh, that uh, we offer through our uh, museum. So now that you've gotten an idea on what our history is and what our present, let's talk about the future. And uh, again, um, I've brought here some images. This is actually quite blurry. And I explain why, <laughs> because I was so excited myself to show that at the first Metaverse conference in Amsterdam this June. Uh, in Amsterdam, uh, we presented the KISS at the Fabrique de Lumière. Uh, you're probably familiar with Infinity Lumière here in Dubai. Uh, so uh, the Atelier de Lumière, which is a French organization, Stefan, I'm sure you know it well, uh, Bruno Monnier, uh, has uh, become like the premium brand of immersive art experiences worldwide, doing these high quality shows and high definition all around the world. And uh, we are so glad that also Klimt, obviously as one of the leading artists in the, in the art history, also has dedicated shows like this one here in Amsterdam. Right now, another show in Seoul, South Korea, uh, another one in New York happening right now. Uh, also dedicated to Gustav Klimt, and we presented at the first Metaverse show at the opening night uh, with a thousand participants, and it was really, really, really amazing to see how art can be appreciated in a whole different way uh, in those immersive art experiences. So, what is this to say? Uh, the museum, and a museum like ours, where our vision is uh, a museum that matters, and a, a museum that matters today means a museum that is open to uh, a wide variety of audiences, to special needs, uh, being inclusive, uh, being uh, freely uh, and open and um, democratized, uh, being able to uh, be relevant to a lot of different topics in life, uh, being close to social issues, being close to the things that matter to the people in their life and to a variety of ages. And uh, as we are looking towards new technology, younger generations with a whole different set of uh, behavior, values, beliefs. And we need to stay uh, in contact with those changes and with, with the disruption. That's why it's so important for us to um, engage with those new technologies and with those younger audiences. This is the core of our motivation as a museum that matters. That's why besides uh, our core duties as a museum, preserving the art uh, history, researching on it, educating about it, presenting, communicating it, we also need to engage with all those new opportunities and the digital disruption as we feel it as an organization. We feel it really as an institution, um, a, a large-scale institution with 300 employees, one of the largest museums in Europe, uh, we need to adapt to new times, to the dynamics of uh, Web3. And this is quite challenging, actually, I have to tell you, now being one and a half years in the Web3 uh, scene, learning a new language, uh, learning uh, you know, uh, all the new channels, uh, the communication behavior uh, in different time zones, engaging with communities, uh, communities all around the world. We've done that as a museum on different levels, but the dimension that we've reached with Web3 is totally different. We are talking also about authority, an institution that was used to uh, from the expertise of the curators, uh, you know, having a, a special authority to educate people about art, and Web3 is turning that around quickly. Uh, the role of an institution, the role of, uh, you know, who is 
who is valuing art, how and, and why. Uh, so it's really interesting to see all those dynamics and I can only say we have taken a first step uh, with our projects but we don't see the limit yet by far and we don't see uh, uh, all the uh, opportunities, the whole scope of this development. Uh, I've mentioned that in the morning already because um, sometimes NFT is very much uh, focused on the numbers and uh, the money. And I think there is a whole different value behind blockchain technology also in terms of art that is not focused on money alone. I mean, yes, our project has been very successful, actually the most successful one for a museum so far, uh, but uh, it is much more than that. It's a, a completely new opportunity to emotionally connect with an artwork and with an institution. And that's what we are trying to do. And we have to balance off as a non-profit organization of the Republic of Austria. We have um, uh, obviously a, a great obligation uh, and a duty to serve the public, uh, to be open as a resource. We are a scientific institution. So we are obliged to preserve the art, educate uh, larger audiences about it, enable access to art, and uh, we are living in times where it gets uh, very, very difficult sometimes to uh, gain access to knowledge, to uh, specific uh, uh, experiences, because of course there is commercialization, I mean there is commerce, uh, uh, commercial activities, uh, around it and we need to balance off both ways. So an institution like ours has always the public offers but also um, the need uh, to sustain the services. I mean due to COVID a lot of museums uh, are in big troubles in sustaining their budgets um, particularly in Europe where we don't have a system like for example in Anglo-American countries where you have uh, a lot of sponsorships, uh, fundraising. Uh, the public households are under a lot of stress because of COVID, the pandemic, and now the energy crisis. So uh, it is very welcome that we as a uh, public institution can also contribute to our budget. And we quite successfully did so uh, prior to COVID. We were one of the few that managed uh, to uh, um, have two-thirds of our own budget uh, made through our revenue. So ticket admission, uh, um, event rental, merchandise, uh, sponsorships, fundraising, and uh, commercial projects. Um, so we need to balance off, and sometimes, you know, that th there's some contradictory elements in it. Uh, I'll be very frank with that. Um, sometimes you have to offer things for free, and sometimes you have to think of, is there an economic model behind it? Uh, we are all learning new forms of interaction. I will show you uh, in a second uh, some of those examples and learn about the possibilities of Web3. Of Web and there's plenty of those uh, as we're learning. We are now uh, internally talking about the metaverse, um, thinking of different opportunities, how to engage with it. But the very first step is realizing how the metaverse, because sometimes it feels the metaverse is something, you know, uh, very ephemeral and hard to reach, or maybe it's only the glasses and the virtual world. We are just grasping the possibilities of such a metaverse. The, what I see the biggest, biggest change would be the interoperability, the connectedness between uh, you know, people all around the world in the same time, you know, instant interaction in a virtual world and we're just starting to get into that direction Then it needs uh, the, the hardware for it and the software for it. But what we can see now, we already, and in green, those are some elements that we as a museum already apply. So we have already uh, in our museum augmented reality, virtual reality experiences, uh, something that we uh, offer for engagement for the audiences. We have uh, started a first blockchain project with the KISS NFT. We have applied artificial intelligence. Uh, I will show you a collaboration with Google Arts and Culture, uh, who does a lot of research and, 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 and great work uh, so promoting the arts. 
Uh, but there's other elements like the Internet of Things, robotics, 5G, 6G, I'm talking about the infrastructure that is needed, that we still need to work, work on and see how that will unfold in the museum world. And this is going to be really interesting uh, in the future to see how we can leverage on those possibilities. And um, there's just some examples, uh, maybe for a later reference, uh, I can share the links to that. And I really encourage you to uh, you know, uh, have a look at our online presence, because it's much more than a website, actually. It is uh, an online collection. We have uh, a majority of our um, objects, and I talked about 20,000 objects, uh, already digitized, so you can actually access uh, artworks on our website, and we encourage you to download it as well and, and use it. Uh, it's not an NFT, it's a digital file, and it's, for most parts, it's uh, free of comments, so IP-free that you can use. We have a lot of art education online, so online guided tours, special formats, where you can interact uh, with the arts or with our experts. We have a digital library where you can research on. We have our own Belvedere Research Center. Um, I will later um, announce also a conference, our online conference, uh, which is also for free, an open um, conference on the, um, an annual conference actually taking place in Vienna and, and now also online uh, on the art museum in the digital age. And uh, in January, we will be talking about the metaverse. So uh, we've invited um, speakers from all around the world to talk about the metaverse uh, and the museum world. Um, so there's all kinds of activities that are already in place uh, showing that we are engaging and experiencing. And I'd like to show you now uh, Google Arts and Culture, the project that we did, Klimt versus Klimt. In 1945, iconic paintings by Gustav Klimt were tragically destroyed in a fire during the war. Only black and white photographs remain. With the help of machine learning, we can now experience these lost paintings in full, vivid color again. Today we're at the Google Arts and Culture Lab and we're gonna colorize Gustav Klimt's faculty paintings. My name is Emil Waller. I work with machine learning at the Google Arts and Culture Lab. My name is Franz Smola. I'm curator at the Belvedere in Vienna. One of my main expert fields is the life and work of Gustav Klimt. We built a tool based on machine learning that colorizes artworks and it's made in three parts. So the first part is that we collect the stories that journalists have been talking about the paintings and we find reference works by Klimt made in a similar time period. And then we take these colors that we find in these paintings and apply it to the black and white images. And that's what the algorithm takes. It takes the black and white images with these color references and then it creates the final artworks. When you see a black and white painting, you have an idea of what it's going to look like. So you assume that the sky would be blue. But for example, in the philosophy painting, the painting is described as greenish. It's, it's shocking. Uh, so we added that color theme to the painting and it really creates that kind of shocking effect because you expect it to be something else. So the, the result for me was surprising because uh, we really were able to recolorate them even in those places where we had no knowledge about the colors but with machine learning we have good assumptions that Klimt had used this and this color so we are on a very good base and a, a very good path to find the right colors. For Klimt lovers, it means that we have recreated a new artwork of Gustav Klimt. Because it makes a big difference if you see only black and white photos. We knew that the works are important, but now we can really value the quality and the importance of Klimt's faculty paintings. So I really encourage you when you get a chance, 
look at the uh, website and you can actually walk through a virtual reality exhibition created with Google Arts and Culture and we will display it in Vienna as well in an exhibition uh, in about a year from now. So again, great invitation to you all to come to Vienna and see it for yourself. Uh, what artificial intelligence and, and human expertise can do together. So another uh, example, uh, I brought this project here where we are in the early stages of a research project, uh, Livia AI, where um, a number of uh, experts in art history work together with artificial intelligence to connect uh, the collections and uh, analyze it and uh, assemble it anew to various topics. Um, other interesting um, means uh, that we apply in the museum itself, for example, Smartify. Uh, anybody familiar with Smartify? May I ask? Not yet. Smartify is the most downloaded museum uh, guide online. Uh, just scan this code and uh, you can download it for free and some of the contents are, um, have to be paid, but a lot of it is free and you can access uh, prime art from around the world. And uh, actually we are using that in the galleries as well and adding specific tours, specific content, uh, and you can visit basically the museum from home, but also use it as a device or with your own device as an app uh, in the museum. So we are trying to add another level. We keep uh, the, the presentation in the museum uh, to the originals, but we add another dimension of uh, appreciation. Uh, again, uh, with an, another Austrian startup called Artivive, uh, a very successful Austrian startup connecting um, uh, the art uh, works with thousands of, uh, of artists on their platform uh, and using augmented reality. So we have an augmented reality app. Uh, again, in the App Store, you will find that for free. You can uh, scan with your smartphone uh, the specific artwork. In this case, for example, Egon Schiele, famous Austrian painter. And you get extra information on your smartphone through augmented reality. So in this case, you see very practically the work, the results of our research center where we have an x-ray. Uh, it's actually around uh, Europe museums coming to us using that x-ray for paintings. We can really uh, look through the different uh, periods of action and the process of painting. And when you scan this in the galleries, just as this lady does here, you get an extra information from the X-ray image showing you what it looked like initially, what the, the, the painter, the artist uh, initially intended with the painting and what different versions of it was. So quite ast astonishing what we can do already and this is only the beginning. So we will see a lot more to come. Uh, in exhibition displays, in digital collection, in the content, in the art education. We are right now working on a, on a gamification for an outdoor uh, experience. Uh, we are working on the optimization of our software infrastructure. This is probably one of the biggest challenges for a lot of attractions to make all the different services work together so it's a seamless process for the customer, for the visitor. Uh, we've done in COVID an extensive customer journey or visitor uh, journey analysis where we detected different uh, stops along the line, phases where we need to improve and we are still working on that. We have restoration and research projects. I've mentioned one uh, with the Livia project. We have digital services and e-commerce uh, that we are all working on. And uh, again, an announcement for January. Um, if you get a chance, it's an annual conference for free. Just register online. Uh, for those of you who can come to Vienna, there's a, a session in our museum on Friday, but the rest of it is online. And uh, just check out the individual speakers. Towards the metaverse, that's the big question. There's uh, some partners I've already been talking to are building actively the metaverse. Yes, we are, we, are, we are glad to exchange ideas on how the museum 
uh, present could look like. I've brought here a, a nice example from Europe. One of the first museums that have built a metaverse presence was uh, the Meta Gallery, Finnish uh, National Gallery, who built the World Exhibition Pavilion in uh, the central land, and they're researching on the results. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see how what they are learning from that and how they will progress. And yeah, we are working on the future together. Uh, have a look at our website again. A great resource uh, to learn about art and to get inspired by. Um, and I'd like now to hand over to Jürgen uh, to talk about ArtEQ before again I will return to talk about the KISS. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure being here on stage again. Um, for all those who have not been here in the morning, my name is Jürgen. I'm founding team member of RDQ, and we are an Austrian-based um, digital art startup. In what RDQ does is truly providing an infrastructure around digital art. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go in detail on the project that we do, but um, the main concern that we have seen in the last um, two years is that there are so many NFT and digital art pieces out there that you as a normal collector um, somehow got lost. Um, there are too many projects and you um, don't know where to invest in. There, that's the reason why we created an NFT investment capital. It is more or less a um, um, collection where we offer our um, investors to invest in by buying an RDQ token. The RDQ token is available on several um, exchanges. Um, when we talk about decent, um, decentralized exchanges, we are available on Uniswap. Um, when we talk about centralized exchanges, we have collaborations with Bitmark and Maxi, two of the biggest exchanges out there that are offering um, the RDQ token. And with the RDQ token, you are not only investing in our collection that we are providing for our investors, but also in the whole infrastructure that we are building with RDQ. So very briefly, um, what are our projects? We have a gallery in Vienna. It is the first gallery dedicated to digital art only. We are also partnering together with other galleries um, around the world, a special collaboration we have with Jacob, a gallery, a very famous gallery in Mi Miami, where we basically <clears throat> push artists together from our network and also from Jacob's network and uh, organize exhibitions um, in Vienna and in, in Miami at the same time. Um, we are now finishing our Art DQ auction house. Um, we're going to go live with the beta version in February um, and we're going to launch in March to April. Um, the unique thing, and I will talk about the auction house a little bit later on, is um, the special offer that you can not only invest in digital um, paintings, NFTs, but also in security painting as we are um, connecting real physical artworks with, the, with our security token. Um, for artists, we are doing loan-to-value program or also digitalization centers. What does that mean? We are offering artists our know-how and also our hardware, our technical um, equipment for creating um, special digital artworks. Um, the MetaQ gallery is our presence on different metaverses out there. And then, obviously, also our strategic partnership with other startups in the um, digital art um, field, but also with um, art institutions, with museums, galleries, or artists are um, very important for our infrastructure. Here you 
can see um, how our location looks like. So important for us is also um, is always combining the digital art pieces also with the physical art pieces. And then obviously we are also um, allowing using all our tools when it comes to our VR glasses or other tools that we offer our, um, our collectors, our visitors in order to jump in into the digital art experience. We have so far realized um, quite a number of projects. That is also the reason why I'm here today. One of our biggest projects for sure is the um, collaboration with the Belvedere Museum, where we, as a technical partner, help to develop the KISS project. Um, we're going to talk later um, on specific on that project, but also other projects we are collaborating with, um, with the Rembrandt Foundation, um, or Feos, Brofos, or Seto Gang. If you want, I don't want to get in, in too much detail now, um, but if you check out our homepage, www.rdq.io, and you, you find all the information um, on the individual projects that we have developed. Um, the RDQ Auction House is not another marketplace. It is truly something different, as with the RDQ Auction House, we first of all tackle, again, traditional art collectors. What does that mean? We somehow, very similar to Sotheby's and Christie's, want to offer our investors and our collectors a human interaction. What does that mean? Um, we are very far. It should be very similar as if you would go to Sotheby's in London or New York or somewhere else, Paris, um, where you basically have your own avatar. You go there and you can um, bid, you can auction on the different digital artworks, but also physical artworks. A second big advantage, and um, compared to others, um, um, something completely new, is as we are, for the last, um, let's say, one year, are working very hard with the Austrian um, government, especially with the, with the Austrian financial um, authorization, um, to get the certificates, to get all the license for um, offering security tokens. What does that mean? With a security token, we are tokenizing underlying real asset. What does that mean? Use case. Um, you have a Van Gogh back home. Um, you can not only make a photo and then sell it as a digital um, asset, but you truly can um, tokenize your physical painting as a um, security token on our platform and sell the security token in our auction house. And this is um, the combination where we believe it will go within the next couple of decades, where we can truly sell and um, tokenize real assets. Um, we are working quite a lot. We are growing at a fast pace um, with our physical and virtual um, galleries and also with our strategic partnership and our auction house, as, you, as I already mentioned. Those three departments, I guess, um, are most important ones. The st strategic partnerships also um, including different, um, different um, partners. Marcus also mentioned it with Artivive. It's a very, very great um, Austrian tech startup. Um, and we are very hard on connecting to other startups, to other um, established companies, um, in order to increase our community, increase the number of artists that we together can push. And uh, we are quite proud of the number of different artists that we are working with. Um, in the end of the day, what brings us to the RDQ Investment Fund, what we have seen the last two years is, um, as I already mentioned, there are so many NFT projects out there that you somehow um, lost the overview. Um, and when it comes to old masterpieces, you don't have the capacity and also not the money to invest in such um, as we call it, blue chip masterpieces. Um, when we talk about a Van Gogh, um, it is um, quite an, uh, hundreds of million. Um, and therefore, this is our solution that we offer as we are tokenizing um, 
digital but also physical artworks and um, sell shares on it. Um, we, ha we have, um, I believe, a very nice mix between um, different employees with different backgrounds. My background is law and art management. We have um, a lot of tech guys, obviously, but also um, a lot of people with art background. Um, and all those knowledge is combined under the RDQ infrastructure. Therefore, we have the, the right people and um, the right leadership with our partners um, that we are working with. Um, well, our key values, um, awareness and trust, as this is one of the most important things in, in the Web3 area, as there is um, quite a lot going on, especially um, within the last couple of months. Um, we want to be transparent. Um, I will talk about the transparency part, especially a little bit later on when it comes to our DAO. Um, so those are the four, I believe, main reasons why um, what we offer our investors. It is a curation um, where you can invest in a collection that we are creating for our investors. Um, we have quite nice utilities. Um, it is secure and we are also becoming a DAO. Therefore, we are inviting our token holder to be part of the decision-making process. Our token, um, very briefly, the tech deals is our um, ERC-20 token built on the Ethereum blockchain. And as mentioned, we are um, tradable on various um, exchanges, um, Uniswap, Bitmart, Maxi, um, and there will be another, um, some other exchanges following soon within the next two to three months. Um, utilities from the RDQ token that you can buy is, for instance, museum tickets. You can stake your um, RDQ NFT um, that you buy from our premium, um, that you buy from, from RDQ projects, um, quarterly NFT airdrops, and so on. This is the token, um, the tokenomics, the token volume and distribution. Therefore, 85% of all the tokens that we have are on the public market. The investment allocation, and this is probably one of the most important thing and also my last slide. Um, the thing is, um, we are transforming ourselves into a DAO. What does that mean? Um, as I mentioned, we want to in um, we want to welcome, we want to invite our um, RDQ token holder to be part of the decision making process. Therefore, we. <coughs> We created a very simple mobile app where we, on a regular basis, ask our um, token holder in which project we should invest in next. Um, it's going to be like, um, hey, Jürgen, do you want to invest in A, B, and C? So that proposals will come from the RTQ management team. However, the decision will come from the community, and therefore, we truly invite our community to be part of the more or less um, RDQ management team as they decide in which direction the whole collection goes. Um, so far we are around um, 16 people, um, mainly tech people, um, but here a brief overview about um, people working with me on RDQ. Um, this is the RDQ roadmap. As mentioned, um, the, the marketplace and our auction house will be the next two big things for next year's, but there are also um, other um, milestones as we are also planning our um, um, convention in Vienna, a Web3 convention, convention for two days, but also our, our, um, the DAO integration will be a huge um, milestone in, in our future. That's it, if you need um, anything, follow us on social media um, and get the latest information on RDQ. So now the third presentation, please. Yeah, now you know who we are and our background to this uh, joint project, great collaboration. And I believe 
Steven will help us again with the presentation to switch again to the... Now we're coming to the most important part of our project that we have been working on for the last, um, well, let's say 12 months. Yeah. Do we start with the video? Yeah, we'll show the video first to get you an idea on the 1 minute 40. For the first time in the history of art, the world-famous masterpiece The Kiss by Gustav Klimt is joining the Metaverse NFT space, and a part of it could be yours. Belvedere Museum and ArteQ are presenting the new era of art collection, turning Gustav Klimt's masterpiece into non-fungible tokens known as NFTs. The KISS NFT drop is your chance to own a limited edition piece of the digitalized masterpiece and become part of the metaverse history. Using state-of-the-art technology, Belvedere Museum and ArteQ converted perfect digital editions of Gustav Klimt's world-famous masterpiece, bringing out details invisible to the naked eye in each individual NFT. The digital artwork is broken down into 10,000 tiles, each having its distinctive coordinates and dedicated numbers. The tiles will be minted one by one and each unique piece be randomly assigned as exclusive NFTs. Every token is imprinted with the number and will provide a digitalized certificate which highlights the owned piece of the digitalized Klimt masterpiece. As a gesture of love or to simply add a personal touch, buyers can add a dedication to the NFT and have the possibility to eternalize their KISS NFT forever. Don't miss out to pre-register for the drop. Simply join our whitelist and get the chance to be a future your owner. Are you ready to be part of a revolutionary masterpiece NFT? So that's our project in a nutshell. And uh, yeah, just connect here with the scan. There's still some available. We have 10,000 NFTs that uh, we started to sell on Valentine's Day. And so far, one fourth is already sold, 2,500. So there's some more left, and uh, we, yeah, we present you the details and the and the background of the project to get you, you know, uh, uh, in the uh, in the know about the project itself. Uh, why we are here is actually connecting with this market because we believe in uh, the in Dubai and UAE uh, as potential partners also for our project, and we had really great uh, talks to. Uh, various partners uh, and, and yeah, we, we look forward to build on that and it, we will be here uh, also later on for, for talks in the breaks and uh, we'll be glad to, to talk to you more about this project. Just in a nutshell to give you an idea how we started that is uh, we thought, okay, our first blockchain NFT project can only be with this masterpiece. So we've decided to do that. Uh, you've seen the individual pieces are artworks on its own. Um, features of, uh, of the KISS NFT are we are the only museum that can claim we have Gustav Klimt's masterpiece. Uh, it will be the only project that we are doing with the KISS, so it's a worldwide unique project and that's the true value of it. Uh, of course, uh, there's others uh, trying to work with uh, sujets of Gustav Klimt, but we are the official authority, can claim this is the unique project. Um, so in an essence, you're really connecting with the institution and with the, the masterpiece, and that's what a lot of people do. They are not trading it so much as an NFT, they are keeping it dear. Uh, for example, I had a great uh, talk to a lady coming up uh, to me, telling me about uh, giving it as an heritage to her daughter uh, uh, for the future, or another couple that had it for a wedding anniversary. So uh, it's an emotional thing. That's why we dropped on Valentine's Day. Um, and the, the tiles are assigned at random. Uh, Articule takes care of all the technical part on the kiss.art. You can look up the dedication, so that's the main utility that comes with it. You can. You have this tile, you can use in, in any ways that you like to do with the digital file, um, but you can also dedicate it to somebody and have it uh, on the, shown on the website and also on screens. Uh, we have 
big screens in the museum showing the dedication if you consent to. Uh, you have free admission to the museum. We have special events. Uh, next one coming up on Valentine's Day. So you will be VIP uh, if you have an NFT, the kiss, uh, and come to the museum at Valentine's Day for this special occasion. We have uh, online events uh, um, that we are streaming from the original. So in the end, we really want everybody who has a Kiss NFT obviously come to the museum as well. So that's in short mm -hmm. <laughs> the features. And it's on Ethereum, by the way. Uh, again, <coughs> for a tech savvy maybe. Yeah, well, sure. Um, at the beginning of the year, when we thought about the chain that we're going to use, um, obviously there are a lot of chains out there, and um, two particular have been in discussion, um, Ethereum or Solana. Solana, the big advantage of Solana is probably as they have a bigger art community, I would say. Um, although they are currently struggling, at the beginning of the year they did very well. Um, in the end of the day, we have chosen Ethereum as the most stable um, blockchain um, that, that, is, that is on the market currently. And therefore, especially if you do such a um, big project, a worldwide project with such a big institution as the Belvedere it is, um, you really need a stable system. And that's the reason why we, why we have chosen um, Ethereum. And we've also launched our ambassador program for anybody holding uh, the KISS NFT for extra uh, um, benefits from it. We've gone through a whole road tour around the world, presented it on Times Square in New York. I hope you can see <laughs> here, uh, first time uh, to show. Uh, it was even bigger. Here's yeah. one and here's one. <laughs> and all around was Times Square in New York. <coughs> For NFT NYC, the leading annual conference on NFTs, 15,000 participants. It's a crazy show in New York and the KISS NFT presented there as well. NFT London, a roadshow to Korea, which is an important market for us, uh, and many other events, uh, just as this one, to engage with the Web3 community because, and here I come already to to learning, so we had media coverage around the world and become one of the thought leaders in the museum world for uh, Web3. Uh, yeah, to the learnings. Um, yeah, we onboarded quite a lot of art enthusiasts, first time setting up a wallet. Who of you has a wallet? Can I ask this question? Ah, who, who of you doesn't have a wallet? Anybody in the room? Great, I've never had this percentage in, <laughs> in our presentation. <laughs> Fantastic. No, if uh, what we experienced, obviously, there's so many, because it's a unique project of a museum, there's so many people onboarding. So we have tutorial videos, uh, you know, we help people to understand uh, the true value of the project. Uh, we've set that up, um, and what, what, our, what, what we have seen, there's a majority fiat payers. So we've seen uh, we have not yet leveraged the whole potential of this true masterpiece in some of the main uh, markets. And there is not so uh, many solutions for B2B onboarding. So companies that would set up a digital art collection have still troubles uh, in terms of uh, you know, the keeping the wallet uh, with a 4 i principle and things like that. And it's still not mainstream, the whole NFT sector overall. We had to explain a lot. Sustainability, a huge issue, of course, because sustainability is a great, great uh, challenge for museums. Uh, we are aspiring to be a green museum and take efforts in that. Ethereum merge in September helped us, helped us a lot. And uh, we see much more potential <coughs> for the future. Maybe here, just to add something, um, when it comes to the, the um, difference between fiat buyers and crypto buyers, um, please keep in mind that we dropped in February, therefore, um, at this point in time, Stripe was not offering um, the, 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 the conversion between fiat and crypto. Therefore, it was a huge challenge to include, to, to do, to develop a an, an, an digital art project where you basically offer both crypto and um, fiat. Although nowadays, half a year later, um, which is in the Web3 space quite a long time, um, now it is a normal thing. But back in the days when we had our drop, it was quite unique. Um, 
that's just something that I wanted yeah, to add. Thank you. Um, and what are the perspectives? I mean, now we are all living through the crypto winter and uh, trying to build, consolidate and uh, build partnerships and collaborations. Again, that's what we're here for, connecting uh, with possible partners, building up that, build on easy access for onboarding new uh, NFT collectors and build customized uh, NFT products. So we are already offering the first products there where you can, with your own NFT, your individual NFT, also display it on special displays on uh, premium products. So you have an extra value and possibility to show your dedication to art and to uh, your specific NFT collections. And yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell. I think we are running out of time and we definitely want to uh, interact and take questions. Thank you for your <laughs> attention. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Very, very nice. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask about your STOs that you're planning to do, because actually I'm working with an STO protocol right now, and I want to know how far along are you in the structuring? Are you, uh, have you done the token structurings? Uh, has everything been confirmed? Are you, do you have active STOs that you're selling? Where exactly are you, and uh, where exactly are you planning yeah. to go? So basically, we have everything um, as we are already on the market. Um, as I mentioned, we are already tradable on Bitmark Maxi um, and Uniswap. Um, we are quite far in this process. Um, so yes. What about the, the tokenization of the physical um, assets? The oh, with the tokenization, yeah, okay. That's what I wanted to ask. Um, well, we have the license from, from the FMR, which is the Austrian Financial um, Authority that we have. Um, we have our marketplace already um, set up, um, and we're going to launch it in February with the beta version. So from a legal point of view, we have everything. From the tech point of view, we are, I would say, 95% um, done. Um, and the next week is going to be crucial for the user journey. There are some, some things we want to change. Um, nevertheless, February. I mean, hopefully I want to help with like structuring the tokens and how many tokens you want to, for example, sell and how many equity, how many debts, because I have experience in that. Yeah. So hopefully. Awesome. Hopefully. Yeah, we can, we can talk later. Sure thing. Model lobby. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really insightful. Um, I have a couple of questions. Firstly, on RTQ, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I read, like, as you're going through the presentation, um, you mentioned a 3.5% per annum staking reward. Yeah. And I was wondering where that came from. Is it like just from printing tokens and dishing it out, or is it from some other stream? No, it's from our token. So it's just a token inflation. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what's the vesting schedule for your team, like locked up tokens? Um, three years. Okay. And uh, I have a question just about the KISS NFT. If sure. You don't mind. So I noticed that you guys priced it in euros rather than ETH. Um, Good is question. there a reason for that? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so we initially started with two different, with one price, 1,850, 1,850 euros. So <clears throat> in February, this was 0 0.65 Ethereum. Um, nevertheless, we are still offering um, the KISS um, by both prices. So you can choose whether you want to invest um, your crypto, 0 0.65 Ethereum, or um, your fiat money, 1,850 euro. So it would be like a variable ETH and then a stable fiat. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. More than welcome. Thank you, Jürgen Marcus, for the presentation. I actually purchased a print of this for my first love, so it has a great emotional significance for me personally. Um, but my question is, you know, the revolution in the world of finance the blockchain brought is this, this concept of self-custody of assets. And to some degree, that's carried over in um, digital artworks, digitally native NFT artworks. In the case of um, physical artworks that are then tokenized uh, on the blockchain, 
that relationship of, of self-custody and ownership is slightly different. So my question is, how do you see the tokenization of physical artworks changing the relationship uh, between you know, the owner, the custodian, and the artwork? I think this is also yeah, on, yeah. On, on me. Yeah, okay. um, well, you know, the, the whole background of what we are doing with our security token and really bringing physical underlying assets on chain is, as we believe that if you tokenize them, if you split ownership, you can sell it cheaper. Therefore, the market is much bigger. I, as a, I would say, normal guy, could never afford an investment in um, a blue chip masterpiece. Um, I mean, there are ways. Masterworks.io is, is a New York-based startup. Um, they are doing it similar. However, they are buying um, blue chip masterpieces in a company, and then they share, uh, they sell shares from the company. We now um, do it um, Web3 based, as we have the token representing um, the physical asset. How many tokens? Um, how many? tokens will be issued for one physical art piece. I don't know yet, as it really depends on the artwork and obviously on the decision of the owner who owns the physical art piece. Did that um, answer your question or, or was it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the tokenized artwork, uh, there are many, many owners, right? It's a, it's a fractionalized yeah. Okay, I, I know where you, where you want to go. What, what, if, what is the relationship between, what does it really mean you know, yeah. to, to own a token, uh, yeah. tokenized artwork? So the owner would need to give us the physical artwork. And the physical artwork from the owner who, wants, who sells it as tokens, um, so the physical art piece would be placed in the bank. We're going to do the last two questions because we're a bit behind schedule. So, sir, over here and over there. Okay, last three. I heard somewhere that uh, one major, uh, I mean, art piece, uh, I mean, it was made as an NFT, and the original art piece was actually burnt uh, down, actually. Are you aware of that, actually? I mean, do you do uh, something similar to that? Uh, uh, I mean, no. you don't do that, Burning? right? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Because the original art piece, the physical copy was burnt down yeah. because uh, because uh, NFT is there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, have you heard about that? And you mean the Damien Hirst uh, stuff? I have no idea about that. Yeah, yeah really he offered sure. basically two versions of it: one physical, <laughs> one digital of his paintings. Also, I believe ten thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing with that project was it was actually half half. The people could decide would they keep a physical, then he would burn uh, the digital one or the other way around. And it actually was quite half-half, uh, what I learned. Yeah. And he actually made a performance in the gallery in London, burning, literally burning right. uh, the artwork that was you know, chosen to be just digital and survived. Yeah, interesting. Not for us, this painting will ever be <laughs> kept safe in a gallery. <laughs> Never happened to us, I can promise. <laughs> No, absolutely not. And it's, it's really securely uh, stored, you know, and presented. What? It's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, there's one more. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Two more. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would like to know, you, you came up with 10,000 uh, yeah. pieces. How? And um, is there a way that you can choose the type of token you want from the piece at, uh, inside uh, the Not at the primary minting. So on the kiss.art, you can buy any time up to five pieces per wallet. That means and uh, the pieces get assigned at random once a week. So we really um, decided on not splitting the artwork. So you see some of the most prominent parts are not yet assigned because it's at random. But on OpenSea, you can choose the pieces, obviously, because you can buy it directly from others so if they are offering. They so if you're looking for specific pieces, you can have a look at OpenSea and buy it there on secondary uh, and market. The price but is the same for any piece. 
price. I'm sorry? The, the price, price in is China is on the, the kiss.art always 1,850. And uh, how will you, I mean, will it, how many rounds will you have on your tokens? There's just one round. Just one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's another question up there yeah. for the yeah. gentleman. Last question, okay. I will, will leave you alone. Yeah. <coughs> thank you for the questions and thank you for the patience, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, my name is Vesa, and first yes. of all, congratulations for securing such a, an iconic masterpiece for this thing. Uh, my, <clears throat> my question relates, if, uh, as a potential investor, is that, of course, this is an iconic piece, but the 10,000 ones that you have, once they're all sold, um, there are going to be thousands and thousands of masterpieces like this to eventually come to the market, out of which you can own a fraction of. But once you've sold everything, you've, you would have made a substantial amount of money. And my, my concern would be, what kind of activation are you going to be doing for the art piece itself? And what kind of a roadmap does it have in order to stay in the public consciousness as a project and for the investors, for them to get their money back or much more, which is kind of the, usually the idea of, of fractional ownership. So I'm wondering if you have a roadmap for it after it's been sold. Yeah, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to explain is we are just building metaverse presence and we will see, and I can tell you exactly, but you will always be in the inner core at the first, I mean, you're the pioneer together with us as an investor. So it will be part, what we're doing now is already, uh, you know, um, uh, offering lots of benefits for the owners of, of the KISS, buying one, the KISS NFT is already, you know, special access to the museum, and there's more to come that we don't have on a roadmap laid out for you yet because we are still in the process of you know, uh, this first uh, project. But uh, yeah, we are already building on metaverse uh, structures and uh, ideas, so you will be in the inner circle as an initial NFT buyer. And but what, it's been planned. There is yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, yes, we are in it for the long run. That's what I'm, uh, I'm just can tell you. I mean, we are, in, as you've seen, a long-term institution thinking long-term. And uh, we're just starting off with this first, the KISS project. But obviously, yes, we want to do more projects. And you, as a you know, member of this core first project, you will always be very close to us as an institution. Yeah, so. Right, guys. Uh, let's give a round of applause for oh, our... Oh, thank you. <laughs> and now, as before, we take a five-minute break in which I ask you not to leave while we prepare the next presentation for the last masterclass of the day. Thank you.
Okay. Hello? Yeah, I mean, maybe we have to push a little bit. Right? Yeah. Okay. So you're doing intervention, I mean, after I introduce, yeah? You, okay. You have the star of the day. <laughs> Because you're going to entertain us. <coughs> Hopefully. No, no, I'll just introduce you and then I'll oh, okay. The floor is all yours. So are we ready? And uh, welcome back for the end of the day. And we're going to finish that master class called the Arc of the Art with someone you already saw this morning. I mean, Richard Zalan, CEO and co-founder at Vernissage. Very happy to, to say it in French, right? So please, welcome. And so you're going to do a master class called Virtual Gallery, a cyberspace for art. And then you're going to entertain us to finish the day with a little game. Am I wrong? Certainly. Yes. Okay. <coughs> you think my mic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Can I bring the people in? 
can you? Yeah, can you yeah, yeah. Me? Bring them in now. Now. Let's wait. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect. <clears throat> Yeah, in the first one. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's tricky because when you are giving only coffee, you want them to say, oh, it's about, it, it, it has to find a good balance. Or there's the food. This is, yeah. Free. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, Prince, let's, let's do it. <clears throat> Let us begin with the final masterclass of the day with Richard Salan. And after the masterclass, a few games, correct? Just one game, yeah. All right, so go ahead. I'm waiting, yours. waiting for the uh, slide to come. <clears throat> Great. Hi guys, my name is Richard Zalan. I'm a, I'm a co-founder together with my wife uh, of Vernissage. And I'm not quite sure whether you actually know what Vernissage is. Many people are asking me, I'm sure French people here know exactly and maybe Russians. Um, but I was asked, sorry, is it too loud kind of? Yeah. 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 What about now? Better? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> well, Vernissage comes from a tradition that was uh, that uh, started around seven, eight, late 1700s, early 1800s. That was, uh, the tradition was that when there was an opening of a big gallery, the owner of the gallery invited artists to put the final touches on the paintings. Uh, yeah, microphone again. On the paintings. What's going on? And, oh, maybe not. Uh, as well as a um, uh, um, last layer called varnish. Everyone might think it's a French word, so it comes from France, but actually it comes from England. And it was called the varnish day. Uh, French adopted it, so I move on to a vernissage now. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you can see, there was the original um, uh, galleries. <clears throat> uh, these, uh, this tradition uh, went to a a very special uh, events because uh, the art collectors had an enormous opportunity to meet face to face with uh, with artists. Uh, however, these days, uh, the Vernissage Day uh, is more of a like a, you find more vino than 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 varnish in those events. They were very special VIP events, and we we thought that was a very very nice name for for our <coughs> uh, for our project. I will, be, uh, I will try to tell you a couple of stories that I hope you will, um, you, will, um, you will learn, you will find out why we are actually doing what we are doing. Um, these paintings, these are our own paintings at home. Uh, there should be a third one, yes. <laughs> About 16 years ago, uh, two young people in front of our house in Australia uh, knocked the door and came with a box of full of uh, um, rolled up canvas. And, uh, uh, we actually chose with my wife probably around uh, eight or ten. We couldn't take all of them, but uh, these are only a few that we have. Um, but what, what I wanted to indicate is uh, these students were from Israel. So they traveled all the way from Israel to Australia just to have exposure, just to uh, show the art and find potential maybe, I don't know, galleries or just to sell their art, which is understandable. Uh, another story I would like to uh, mention is uh, maybe not such a uh, positive in a way. However, uh, it turned out 
bit negative. Uh, our friend Arthur, uh, he was an um, uh, engineer of uh, electrical and mechanical engineering, but he loved art. And he actually went to New York, studied art, and he stayed there for quite some time. He wanted to polish his hand and, and, and you know, the techniques. And uh, when we saw this painting, it was half finished. The moment we asked him, can you finish it for us? We, we want to buy it. We, 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 we just love this life uh, uh, harvest. And he did it within two weeks. However, uh, he, never, he never followed his passion. He never um, tried to, to build his brand. And uh, we don't know what's happening. I think he sold a few paintings, but not that many. <clears throat> uh, this is a quite, <laughs> quite interesting one. I met this artist uh, maybe a few months ago. Um, who, who was a photographer, and uh, during the lockdowns, he, he didn't have any means to take any, any photographs. Um, so he was at home, stuck with uh, basically his own environment, and he found uh, uh, inspiration in taking pictures of cigar and cigarettes, ashes. This is what it is. And uh, since then, uh, he, he, he keeps doing it, and uh, he also developed his um, um, uh, why ashes. Sorry, I missed, missed that. Why ashes? Something drew him towards ashes, and when we talked, he showed me his uh, really disfigured skin on his arm, and he said, "As a child, I was burned by, by boiling water. Obviously, there was something pulling him to ashes, and now he's running a podcast for for burn victims." Uh, to um, bring them to, 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 to uh, society, to uh, come out from hiding, because it's, uh, it could be a very disfigured body uh, when, you, when you burn. So he's um, very inspirational, I would say. <clears throat> Another artist, again, a couple of months ago here in, uh, in Dubai, uh, he's John from Liverpool. And um, uh, as a child, he, he never was keen at school learning. Maths and physics were not really his domain. So the teacher asked him, uh, what do you want to do? I just want to draw. I just want to paint. So uh, that's what he started doing. However, age 16, he decided he's a grown-up man. So he started partying, alcohol, drugs, and, and so on. And uh, his girlfriend stuck with him for quite some time. This is John, actually. Oh, sorry, I pressed too much. <laughs> uh, and uh, the girlfriend stuck with him, and now his wife, they have a child, and he went through a couple of rehabs, and he is selling, actually here, his exhibition sold out completely. Uh, one of the uh, exhibitions here on uh, City Walk, all uh, exhibitions gone. His domain was, uh, at that time, the series was kind of portraits. And he's experimenting now with NFTs and different utilities. Uh, it's not happening. Okay. 84%. What the hell is that? <laughs> this is out of all selling artists globally, only 16% belong to uh, those uh, um, celebrities, uh, big artists, big names, um, uh, kind of established artists. 84 are emerging artists. Uh, I don't want to even bring the figure of those ones who never exhibited anywhere. Uh, emerging artists are usually those ones who are exhibiting in their little local place. If they're from, I don't know, different country, different villages, uh, the, the, locally, so they don't have this exposure. It's 80... Oh, what happened? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Uh, and that was our, basically, idea to bring those artists, these emerging artists, and actually cherish uh, the... Um, the the art, cherish the, the will to, 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 to produce art. And uh, uh, what Verinsas wants to offer is um, uh, help them to build their own brand, uh, help them to become, uh, to tell their own story. As you can hear, all the stories I've mentioned, they're all based on certain exper uh, experiences in life. And as a buyer, as a collector, you do want to hear the story. And I remember being one of the galleries and the gallery owner showed us all the other paintings and the, every single painting he had some story and I felt so connected with that means I'm very much inclined to buy it without the story it's just an empty kind of colors unless you're familiar with that unless you understand that speaks to you through some other ways but story is basically one of the most important things 
uh, in art. I want to bring you, just ponder for a minute at these paintings. I'm sure you see Monet, Hand, you see Dali, that's my, my favorite actually. Uh, you see Van Gogh. Do you know what it is? Anyone? Okay, this is AI. This is AI art. It took me and my wife create all of these paintings within literally three minutes. And uh, I think this is quite controversial. Um, we we'll used the software called Mid Journey, where you type command what you want to um, create, and the AI recycles all the previous images, paintings, uh, it creates something new based on your commands. Um, in, uh, um, in August this year, there I in August this year, in uh, um, Colorado, uh, there was a, a kind of uh, competition where one of the artists mm, exhibited his art. And um, his name is uh, Jason Allen. And this is what he created. This is AI. He, uh, he managed to, to, take, to create about 900 images. Uh, where the last three, he spent about 80 hours to uh, get it to the final uh, state. The lady in the, in, in the center, unfortunately, came out without a head. So he had to go to <laughs> Photoshop and, and add the head with hair. So uh, I think AI is quite, quite controversial. Uh, I'm not sure whether many artists would like to uh, compete with that. Uh, I would say... Uh, like when you buy your first iPhone, you suddenly become a photographer. Like you have AI, you immediately become an artist. Uh, I don't think so. And this is such an abundance of great art, great artists. Why, why go for that? Of course, there are uses for that. But um, there's another aspect of AI that people might not even know that. You cannot copyright it. It's, you cannot put IP on it or copyright rights. Uh, simply because uh, uh, law says that copyrights need to be, or IP belongs to a human, not to algorithm. Uh, now, this is my creation. <laughs> and this is how I did it. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah. My prompt was blue dog in the galaxy wearing long red coat. What do you think? Cute? <laughs> Um, it took literally a minute or two. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, now the topic of uh, many days uh, here, NFTs. Uh, there are certain aspects of NFTs uh, that people should be aware of when you buy NFT. That when you buy NFT of an art, you do not automatically... Uh, get copyrights. You do not. Only artist has to give it to you. So, unless it's in a smart contract, purely indicated, uh, you own the rights. If it is not, you don't have rights. And even to that point, that if you buy the NFT and you take it, off, it's been taken off the market, of the marketplace, and you want to list it again, you need to show the image. When you show the image again, it is actually not legal according to the current laws, that uh, you actually, it's, it's, it's a copyright violation. Um, I have a couple of things I just want to mention. Um, NFTs, uh, yeah, redefined print. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, displaying, NFT, yeah, even displaying your NFT in a, in a restaurant, in a bar, or other place, you think you own it, you can plug it to a, the, on a screen, on a you know, video screen, you actually cannot do that unless you have direct, um, direct uh, release of copyrights. Another thing, royalties. Royalties are, are very tricky. I, I touched the topic earlier today in a, in a conversation. Um, Everyone says, ah, we have smart contract, means royalties go to the artist. Not always, and there are ways around it, and many actually using it. How do you do it, for example? Not that I suggest anyone to do it. Uh, if you buy the NFT, 
and um, uh, you want to resell it on the same marketplace, the smart contract will be triggered and the royalties go to, to the artist. If another sale happens on the same marketplace, or the smart contract is triggered. If you, for, a, for example, you want to send this NFT from your ledger, so you take it off the market, put it on the ledger and send it to another ledger, there is nothing to trigger, nothing to trigger the smart contract. Um, or go to another marketplace, uh, nothing triggers this contract. Uh, so you need to be uh, aware of, probably mostly artists, uh, need to be aware of that. That royalties are not always the case. Uh, I think I have um, uh, one more thing. Oh. Okay, I just mentioned that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, okay. It, 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 I had to convert it from Mac to Windows, and uh, it's not bringing it properly. Anyway, so we, we actually saw that. Uh, saw that. <clears throat> uh, I have a message. A message. A little story from my wife. Uh, co-founder about making the metaverse real and uh, I wonder if you agree with that or, or what's your opinion maybe later you can say that sound 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 oh gosh do we have prints do we have sound I'm sorry. No, not that one. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Oh. oh. Oh, gosh, we did it so many times. Tested it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the topic which is close to my heart, the metaverse. I must admit that only a few weeks ago I was a huge skeptic. There's so much hype around it, including from consulting companies that are probably looking for the next big thing. To me, it was like a deja vu or something that we saw already with blockchain in 2017 or the internet before the bust. But I have a few insights to share with you and uh, let's see, maybe you agree with me or disagree with me. Firstly, as you probably know, there is no shared or grand vision of the metaverse. The paint is still wet, so to speak. It's vaguely defined and that's a problem, I would say, because we don't understand all the opportunities, challenges and key uncertainties involved in the metaverse. Meanwhile, there are 2,500 companies, both Web2 and Web3, some of them making multi-billion dollars on dollar bets on different technologies. Apple, for example, is betting on augmented reality, on mo monetary infrastructure and mobile. Snap, who would have thought they're even in the game, are heavily investing in brain to consume to computer interface, and they've been quietly doing a lot of acquisitions. Meta is betting on VR and goggles. But I believe that a genuine metaverse is not about VR headsets or avatars or virtual conferences and meetings and concerts. As one scientist puts it, it's all kindergarten. To me, the metaverse is something different. It's a conception and design of a totally new world and a new reality. And such reality is a fusion of our physical, digital and biological worlds. So that you and me can experience the metaverse in a way that's no different from reality, with all our five senses involved. But there are lots of challenges, and I'm going to talk about only three of them for the sake of time. And one is digital identity. Digital identity will make or break the metaverse. The internet as we know it was developed without the native identity layer. So will it rely on a legacy player, ID mediated by a third party, a government, a university, your employer? That's very inefficient. There's, then there's proof of personhood, which is what WorldCoin is doing with its biometrics. But unless most people on the planet subscribe to, to the service, they're very uh, vulnerable to civil attacks. Then there are verifiable credentials, which is Web3 standards, where credentials are zero knowledge proof at the holder's discretion. 
They have a key limitation though, they don't support most of the applications because of this unilateral privacy. And then there is a new concept, soul-bound tokens, tokenized representations of a whole host of traits and features, achievements, attributes that make up a person or an entity. And unlike NFTs, they are non-transferable and non-tradable. The architectural framework is still not decided and we don't know whether it's going to be centralized, decentralized, whether it's going to be federated, hybrid, what will it be? It's still a very big open question. Number two, infrastructure. Existing 4G uh, communication technologies can barely afford at the moment AR and VR applications. Low latency and high bandwidth 5G networks are a lot better. They are better suited for machine-to-machine -machine communications, but they are not suited for large-scale user interactivity. Then the, uh, all these immersive multimedia and personalized holograms, multi-sense haptic services, they are not supported by current net networks. Executives do realize this, and according to one Intel executive, truly persistent and immersive computing at scale and accessible by billions of humans in real time will require a 1000x increase in computational efficiency from today's state of art. Um, and we need 6G, definitely, um, and judging by us, past trends, the next generation, 6G, will only be available for consumer use by 2030. And then there is the elephant in the metaverse room, and that's the energy question. Nobody talks about it, or um, not enough at least. A fully immersive metaverse will remain a fantasy unless we solve the energy issue. Forecasts from a reputable study predict that by 2030, between 20% to 50% of all energy produced to, uh, today will be consumed by the ICT industry. Nuclear scientists claim that we're already heading towards energy catastrophe and that can only be made worse by the energy demands of the metaverse. So-called renewables will not solve the problem at all because their ROI is considerably low, lower than those of conventional sources. So I very much agree with the scientist who says that creating a metaverse at the expense of life on the planet is ridiculous and should only be pursued within the context of a radical transformation of our energy sources. So just to sum up, well, the good news is the metaverse will happen, whether we like it or not. But it will be very different from what we imagine it to be today and probably a lot cooler. It will be a fusion of physical, digital and biological worlds. There are still a lot of problems to be solved. There can only be one one metaverse, that's how I believe it should be. We don't have multiple versions of the internet, do we? And otherwise we'll end up with all these world wall gardens again, no different from Web 2, what we have now. Digital identity is at the heart of it, and what form it should take is anybody's guess. Every infra infrastructure layer for the metaverse will need a serious upgrade. And finally, until we solve the energy issue, both on the production and on the consumption side, there will be no metaverse. Thank you so much for your attention and have a great day. Uh, sorry guys, you probably heard this noise at the background. Uh, no, this is what we're facing every day now, because there's a big concert in front of our balconies and the uh, musicians were rehearsing for football cup so that's every day actually anyway <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you very much for that um, now i would like you to, in <laughs> to, like to invite you uh, we all like to use our phones we constantly using our phones so put it to the good use because i have a game for you you need to take your phone And you can win prizes. Oh, oh. <clears throat> but can we can we bring the screen up? Because uh, yeah, yes. Now I would like you to uh, okay go classic mode, please.
I would like you to log into kahoot.it and type that number when you're going to be asked. I will move away because. Uh, yeah. Go to www.kahoot.it, like a kahooted, and type this uh, pin when it's asked you. You got it? Okay, Vesas here, Roger, lovely. Uh, let's wait for other people to. Kaza, Marcus, great. Any more? Let's give it a few minutes. The, uh, the game is about you have to be correct and very fast. Because the faster you answer the right question, correct, uh, correct answer, the higher your score would be. The first question, I will wait here. The first question will be kind of without any points. Very simple for you to actually understand uh, how it works. Maybe let some more people. Huh? Any more? Done? Okay, uh, uh, Prince, let's go. Someone has just joined in a second. <laughs> so the first question coming up. Okay, two people answered. Oh, okay. I'm Tatiana. Uh, okay, next one. That will be with points now. There's usually some music behind, but too complex for the technology. I move away. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. In your way? No? No? It's a difficult one. Thank you. 
ใช่ทั้งหรออยู่ดึงว้าวนี่เกสทานอ่ะเนี่ยเบรบโอว้าว last one That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So who won? Okay, let's okay. stand. Yeah. Tano. Who is Tano? You are Tano, yes? Okay. Okay. Can we please welcome Tano? Come here, please. Step on the stage. I prepare some little gifts. <laughs> Quite the time, yes. There you go, Tano. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, that is here. That is here. Oh, thank you. You are good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Number two, Stan. Where is Stan? Ah, there you go. <clears throat> this for you. Congratulations on the second place. <clears throat> And uh, Rames, who is Rames? Ah, there it is. Just to wipe your tears a little bit, okay? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> This is uh, something for you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Come, come here. Yeah. Thank you. So this is it from uh, from uh, Richard Zalan and Vernissage. Um, do you have any questions or any comments? When did I go wrong? When did I go right? Nothing. <clears throat> It doesn't work. I'm an NFT. Oh. <clears throat> I'm an NFT artist, and I didn't know that if someone buys my NFT, they can't even display it publicly. I don't. Where is that written? Who well, uh, I know what you mean. Um, and actually, this is a surprise. When I was preparing myself, I wanted to understand that. I'm not a lawyer, definitely. You probably know that. Um, but according to, uh, based on U.S. law, and U.S. law has been applied in many countries. Not many other countries have a very strict law about digital art. But what it stands for is when you create your piece of art, actually. The art is the original, which is they call a cop original copy, which is a copy. It's on your computer. So you, because you created it, you have your copyright. You can make a copy of that and put it for sale on marketplace. Correct? Correct. If I buy this NFT from you, I have not received copyrights. Therefore, if I use that to display somewhere, I'm actually making a copy. Because I'm not using, uh, you haven't given me permission to that. It's a copyright, and I think this is very strange. I didn't know that either. When I was reading it, and I do I understand it right? Yeah, that's what they said. So, what kind of consequences would there be for someone who's bought my art and that they display it? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there some legal ramifications if you put it out on Times Square or something? Uh, I, I think at the moment it's probably the consequences would be uh, no one cares at the moment. <laughs> to put it simply, uh, I don't think many people care. 
And um, I think because we still have majority of NFT market is all collectibles. And um, collectibles are usually uh, given as a, you can have it, but piece of art is something different. Collectible cannot be considered as, I'm mean, talking like apes, okay? I'm referring to apes. Human did not create it. Uh, it's 10,000 apes. Uh, I wish to find a human who would draw 10,000 apes. It's an it's a, it's a AI. Put different hat, different color, different shirt, different cigar or something. So it's not copyrighted. But when you create your art, you have all the rights. Unless if, if I want to buy your art, you want to display, I know I want to display, um, the consequence would be you would actually like me to have these rights because I would promote you, frankly. So I would be the one who's promoting Vesa's work. And obviously, it will be known as Vesa. Why I'm doing it? Because I have copyright from you. Otherwise, I can't. I mean, that's legal stand. <clears throat> Anyone else? Uh, thank you. But this is really like super confusing and very difficult to identify when it comes to the public uh, exposure. Yes. So is there a, what will be like the way to control it? I, I think because we are very early stages, the very small percentage of uh, global population actually is in the blockchain, and especially in NFTs or let's say digital art, I don't think it doesn't pose any danger yet. But I think when it becomes more mainstream, I think uh, um, legal aspect will be very much uh, implemented. Uh, at the moment, it's kind of a wild, wild west. Um, I, I was not aware of that, actually. I, didn't, I was not aware of the fact that <clears throat> royalties, everyone says, I have a smart contract. Royalties go to artists. No, because there are loops, I mean, loopholes. You, know? you, you can avoid it. Now there are even uh, marketplaces where uh, the company or the, the, the gallery removes royalties. I'm not sure where does it come from. Yes, they actually remove royalties. Um, but somehow I see it's mainly, mainly for those, for those ones who want to buy and flip and sell. And so they want to remove the extra benefits going to, to the artist. Um, actually, I did some research before that. Uh, so I've learned a lot from that. Actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. <coughs> you did. You don't like your present. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> very, very good idea to make at the end. Uh, the gamification. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Very well done. So, regarding to Bored Apes, uh, that is made by AI. I think it's made by a machine at the end. It's like programmatic stuff. AI is more for uh, something that learns on the go, and. Uh, Bored Apes art were made by a human. Well, the probably in, in the initial sketch, yeah, exactly. but then it was repeated like... Yeah. yeah, and also you can make like infinite, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe there, you, there, there are going to be at the end repetitions that they delete, of course, to make 10,000. So um, just to add uh, to the last conversation that for me, you can have copyrights in the Bored Apes NFTs. Yes, actually. And they all actually yeah. have, and they guarantee to you that you can use it on your business. True, these platforms are actually giving owners complete um, creative commons. Basically, they can do anything they want. And uh, that is actually an interesting concept because they didn't have it before. Uh, they were kind of very strict. But they changed the licensing and they said, you can go for it. You know, print your shirt or t shirt with your ape and be happy. Otherwise, you can't do that. I cannot, for example, from Vesa, I buy art, I cannot print it on my shirt, I cannot use it unless you give me the rights. What's interesting about AI, sorry, <coughs> I skipped through it very briefly. There was confusion with the clicker. <laughs> um, AI is based on learning what's from the past. Just, you cannot deny it. It doesn't look into the future. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to, to convert, I mean, uh, compare it to uh, uh, greatest, uh, you know, impressionists. Monet and, and, uh, and uh, say Van Gogh and, uh, with their art, I mean, Van Gogh was, was a special case because no one knew about him, actually, to, to be honest. But, 
But Monet was banned from displaying his art because it was not considered art. Until then, people always knew, you know, Rembrandt and on the classic, you know, brush strokes, where, where, where he presented something very different. And I believe, I suspect, we are experiencing a very new type of art uh, that we might not understand, we might not probably agree with that, but I guess it might probably happen. We, there would be a new trend, but AI cannot predict new trends for the future. Cannot think of, okay, let's think of uh, uh, you know, Monet style of painting. It cannot. So uh, recycling these this pictures or the images by AI is fun, it's great, it's uh, enjoyable. I said, wow, Dali, I painted Dali. <laughs> but uh, it's a very limited use. The way I can see it to be used for is for advertising, for your website, for, for if it is artists just to want to show something. I can see the use case for that. I mean, especially those ones I was pointing, not the blue dog in the galaxy. <clears throat> uh, I mean, that's all I want to say about uh, AI, actually. Thank you. Do you have any last question? OK, let's do the last one. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, you, you mentioned in the questions about royalties, um, that the royalties are not received unless it's sold on the same marketplace. Correct. I think the situation is actually worse than that. Um, in the, at the moment, the smart contract does not programmatically enforce any royalties whatsoever. It essentially just contains a request for the marketplace to apply a certain amount Correct. of royalties. And it's completely optional whether each marketplace uh, respects that, right? So someone can buy something on OpenSea and they resell it on LuxRare and they don't respect any royalties. And OpenSea has just recently made a change where they will no longer enforce any royalties yes. unless you upgrade your NFT so you can only list it on their marketplace. <coughs> Which goes back to this walled garden view of everyone having their own closed platforms. So. Um, I think the situation needs to be changed where there's some sort of programmatic enforcement of these royalties. So you're not depending on wh which marketplace, whether they optionally enforce it. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, again, we are in the process of learning about it and discovering and creating new technology. The only <coughs> thing I need to remember uh, that smart contract, we all tend to use it. Ah, it's it does job for you. No, smart contract is either smart nor it's a contract. It's, it's nothing like that. As, uh, as a father of smart contracts, uh, Nicola, I think, Shabo, I think from, uh, from uh, Ethereum kind of uh, in, origin, he actually said, smart contracts are like a brain of vending machine. When they receive, when the vending machine gets one dollar, it dispatches a can of Coke. If the machine doesn't receive a dollar, it doesn't dispatch. Uh, that's the logic. Um, so I think there will be some some ways of, of preventing it. I also see another <clears throat> potential, not that I want to blame artists for that, but if one artist uh, offers the work on one uh, marketplace and also the same work on the other marketplace, there's no technology that will actually trigger that, that is something like a red flag, uh, that has already been there. Obviously, it will be, uh, you know, the artist burning its own, you know, shooting its own foot. Uh, obviously using reputation and so So at the moment that governs probably this, this problem. But at some point, I think it will happen. Uh, even on the same Ethereum blockchain, they're not recognizing each other. There's two means of the same art. It's interesting actually. We have those technology, they should be there, you know? Whoever comes up with that, that would be great, you know? It's not an unsolvable <laughs> problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, I think. Thank you very much, guys. We can wrap it up. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for Thank you, Richard. Thank you for your support, patience. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm very frustrated, actually. I wanted to see the gift. <laughs> oh, you didn't win. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, no, but just, I mean, uh, thank you for entertainment, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you for that day. So, tomorrow, this is the program. It's a very interesting one. Future of finance, reinventing money. Uh, we'll talk uh, during the masterclass how the investment thesis for crypto is changing and about tokenizing tangible assets. So it's going to be a good
good day too. So thank yeah. you people and see you tomorrow. Thank you.